girls. Let's do this. Yeah, good morning to you, Living Soil Nerds. Uh, happy Thursday. Uh, I kind of wanted to start this show to involve Peter as well. You know, I think um, something was missing the last two years with the cannabis community and the way that people are getting together. So I kind of wanted to talk to you, Peter, about your event um, on March 1st, because I feel like that is what really starts to when, whenever I've seen any real progress is when people are getting together in a live setting, communicating. Yes, it's great to communicate on social media, uh, but the real work, it seems like, is done in thoughts and, and friendships and networking. All that stuff is done at some of these expos. So I kind of wanted to talk to you about this and see if this is going to be a regular thing. It is. And uh, let me just. All right. Do I sound okay? Yeah. Uh, the event was awesome. Uh, the band, without <laughs> dropping F, they, they killed it. The, the band was so tight. And uh, like that, you know, pre-COVID, I was doing events and I kind of had a vision of like what I wanted to do. And then obviously COVID hit and it was like, you know, stuff like this where it's like zoom style conversations with everybody in their house which is awesome but like it, it's so not i mean the way it ended up playing out was everybody just brought their own weed and their own rosin and you know stuff they grew stuff their friends grew stuff they washed up their friends washed they brought their rigs they brought their pipes they brought their you know everything and just the, the venue we used to be able to smoke in. So pre COVID we you know, you can't be a, a douche about it and have like 20 joints going in a, in a bar, but like you could have two joints going and kind of like do what you want to do. Uh, but the issue now is that with COVID like policy, the inspectors are showing up all the time. Like the inspectors never showed up previously, like surprise, we're here. <laughs> What's going on in your establishment? And now uh, they show up almost every night. And so the owner was like, yeah, please don't smoke inside. And he was like, but you can all smoke right outside on the patio. And I was like, wait, come again. <laughs> and there's this big, you know, patio with like the, the dangling, uh, Lights. like the dangling lights around the out like everywhere like well lit uh it was seven you know maybe just under seven i mean it's la and it was like a perfect night um there were chairs and benches and uh so i was just like fuck it let's move this upstairs and outside and we'll like throw some people together and have some conversations and just kind of let everyone chill and do their thing and it was there's a lot of dudes uh so in the future i'd like to i'd like to bring the ladies out <laughs> the, the men were well represented in the in the la <laughs> weed scene that night and uh but it was fun and uh and then basically the band was ready to play and we all went back downstairs and uh i i was super super high by that point and like trying to run multiple cameras so i was like now I remember <laughs> why why I wait till I start filming before getting super high normally. And I was also like four beers in and um, feeling no pain. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but it, it was like I was as I was listening to the band play, I was just like, this is awesome. And I have another band that I think a lot of people know uh, who is down to do something but i don't want to say the name of the band yet uh but they're they're doing an la tour uh like long beach and then like pasadena and uh they gave me two days that would work for them to to make a kind of surprise appearance in la um but i'm so psyched to just do these like get togethers I mean, right now it'll probably be like every couple weeks, but I mean, if it was every, basically with a bar, I was like, just give me your worst night. Like, I just want to make it easy on you. Like, get what, what is Tuesday night, a bad night for you guys. And I was just like, I'll take Tuesday, like, let's do it. And, uh, 
and it was awesome and i'm psyched and uh it's also like i mean there are people who were like yeah i drove like two hours up from san diego or or like a couple hours in from anza and i was like holy shit dudes i drove like 15 minutes from (laughs) from (laughs) from santa monica down to venice uh but uh yeah no so so i'm psyched i mean it's uh it was fun to get back into it and like, like Emerald cup was kind of the last, uh, thing I did. And I spent the entire Emerald cup just sitting on a couch, smoking joints with people who brought like their best weed. I was like, I was like, if I could structure my life like this, where like, that is my life. (laughs) uh life will be good and that that that's what this was it was like all the socal you know it's like like uh uh meerkat kind of like popping out of their like respective holes and being like what there's like a a sesh like and everybody comes running over so uh it was uh yeah i i'm psyched i'm 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 (laughs) the the reason i sent you guys the link late was because i'm like piecing together all the video uh like multi-channel video and uh we gotta mix down the the audio and layer that on top and then i want to put the the concert out um you know and i view that side of it kind of like in the same way that we bring on i mean it's rare we bring on a big name in kind of any of the stuff we do because i feel like they don't really need attention or help like uh and it's always fun to kind of be like here's some random obscure person who's just doing cool shit and like let's listen to what they're up to and uh i kind of feel like the same way with bands where i'd love to just kind of have up and coming bands that are i mean these guys were so i i i can't it was an eight piece reggae band with like three horns, keyboard player, drummer, the bass player was just like, and and I have everything, every single track isolated. So like, I want to just listen to his bass playing, like, and then the drummer was amazing. He was like, there were a bunch of Brazilian. I mean, the cool thing was like the band came and smoked with everyone. So like the trumpet player was like, what's going on out here, guys? And I was like, Tyler, Family Tree Seeds, like, roll this guy a joint and smoke him out. And Tyler was like, <laughs> no problem. I got him taken care of. <laughs> and the trumpet player was like, like, this is amazing. And then, like, he went back in and, and rocked out on the trumpet. Or, or sorry, the, uh, the tr- he was on the, uh, the trombone, not the trumpet. And uh, <clears throat> so it's like the band was happy and, and, and well-medicated. And, uh, yeah, it was... I'm uh, I'm still mentally processing. As, as I said to Leighton, I was like, I'm in a good mood today. <laughs> like yesterday, I was like all hungover and, uh, but yeah, I'm uh, I did not know I was going to be talking today, so I was like, I'm just gonna chill. <laughs> <laughs> so much for that, right? Man, but anyway, it's, it's cool it, to it, see it, live it, events again, people hanging out and, you know, doing cannabis where they can actually consume cannabis on the location uh, here in Colorado. That's extremely hard to do unless you're paying a hefty fee. So just I hope that you do a lot of those and that at least there's more California events and stuff, because that really is where action starts to take place. Yeah. And I mean, the 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 medium term goal is to broadcast them all live. Um but I was like, do I really feel like stressing myself out anymore for tonight? And I was just like, fuck it. Like, <laughs> uh, and that's kind of the idea of having your own venue where like I had, so at the end of the night, it's like midnight and I have to like break down all this gear and like pack it up and it's like dark and like I have shitty vision now anyway. And I'm like, all right, I probably forgot half my stuff. And uh, if you have your own venue, it's basically like this camera, like in my garage, never moves. So I don't have to break it down every day and re- and set it back up. And so if you had a venue, it's like, all right, we have like the front of house camera getting the whole stage. We have like 
two cameras mounted on the side and then maybe like someone walking around with like a handheld um all going back to the to the video mixer which is like in one spot right next to the audio you know the soundboard which is also right next to it run by some dude who knows what he's doing uh so that's uh hopefully coming soon that's all i gotta say about that <laughs> excellent man well i'm glad you're at the helm of it i know that uh if you're able to keep up with consistency that seemed like the main thing if you do it at least once a month uh the community really responds to that so well technically i'm i'm doing it every other tuesday uh even better i mean yeah. so the other thing is i'm like fuck now i need to like you know find bands and uh that in and of itself is like a I was like, I need someone to volunteer to be like, I'll be in charge of booking bands. And But what's cool is now I have the video where I can show other bands that can be like, this, this is what I want you. you to do. Yeah, this could be you. So everybody watching, you need to like watch those videos, like them, be like, we will love any band that comes on here. And then I can be like, do you want all that love? <laughs> we can make that happen. Uh, and exposure. I mean, a lot of bands. Chris Guerrero down in the LA area. Are they willing to travel? Actually, the band that played uh, up in at the Seed Swap uh, that Joey Berger put together wants to come down. They actually wanted to come down for Tuesday, and I was like, I got. We're good for Tuesday night, but maybe they can be the band uh, for next time. If you do it every uh, couple of weeks, it gives you some breathing room too, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it it's like I love just the idea of bringing cool music and you know all different styles. Like that was reggae. I was like, I'd be happy with a jazz trio, just like rocking out, or or like some dude on Ableton doing like a an electronica performance or rock band or kind of could go in any direction as long as it's good <laughs> there you go <laughs> well cool i hope that was uh, enticing enough for more and more people to be involved because um I, I think i've said this three times now but that is that is honestly how things get done and if you're able to do it twice a month uh weeks go by pretty quickly i think we all can attest to that doing the show once a week you know i mean it Seems like the uh, well, weeks fly the, by. The, the, cool, the cool thing was when when we were doing it, uh, I felt bad for the bartender because uh, she was down, like, everyone's smoking weed, and they're all upstairs and outside. So I was like, I know you rely on tips. I was like, here's 200 bucks. I don't want you to stress about the tips. She was like, ah, thank you so much. And uh, But she was like, we should just move everything outside. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, we could set the bar up outside. And I was like, really? <laughs> she was like, yeah. So I was like, you mean the bar could be outside? And she's like, yeah, and the band could play outside. I was like, wait, the band could also be out? I was like, so we just do the whole thing outside under, you know, it's like a tent. So, you know, obviously if it's raining, you probably wouldn't do it out there. But if it's like overcast, you're good um when does it ever rain here that's what i was about to unmute myself for like you guys have yeah. the perfect spot to try this shit outside yeah no uh, la it's like <laughs> that's, that's why i love seeing la drivers on the highway when it starts to like sprinkle and they're all like oh my god like this is dangerous <laughs> slow slow it down <laughs> Bring 20 it miles an hour on the highway <laughs> all, all five all five lanes in, in one direction all going 20 miles an hour freaking out right so all right all right cool let's uh let's start the show just wanted to kind of kick that off peter just to kind of admire what you've been doing man it's 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 next level when people are getting together and then you have this platform as well so who knows where that could go thank you all right, Mr. Layton, uh, people want to pick your brain, sir, each and every week. You know, we've been trying to, to mix it up so that we do have guests and keep that going fresh. But at the same time, uh, you're able to articulate things, I think, that maybe others aren't able to. And people resonate with that. So today we're going to kind of talk about nutrient cycling. I know when you first get into this, especially if you're an indoor farmer, maybe even coming more from a synthetic side of things, 
Uh, you might not have ever really understood that. You just understand that Mother Nature somehow is able to take hold of things. There's obviously no one going out there and fertilizing things. So how does that happen? How is, uh, you know, when a, when a healthy living soil system is built, how is it that for the most part, farmers find that they don't have to uh, monitor pH or if they do choose to monitor, they don't really mess with the pH. They just kind of know where, where it is and how it's moving. Uh, a lot of that stuff obviously is coming from just understanding how Mother Nature works. And we kind of, you know, when you're a newer farmer, most of these concepts, you're, you're trying as best as you can to bring indoors. Uh, you're trying to maybe replicate that in a small tent or move up to a basement and then hopefully grow outdoors or in a, in a larger facility. So, uh, Leighton, I know that, you know, for the most part, people understand nutrient cycling. So I kind of wanted to just let you have like a simple definition on that. And then I did want to go maybe intermediate with this a little bit so that it is a little bit deeper um, because there's a there's a bunch of videos online and stuff. But, you know, having your brain here, I'd love to kind of go deeper today as well. Yeah. And I would say, Peter, just keep an eye on the questions. Um, let's try to hit them as we go um, instead of rewind, rewind it and go back to the beginning. Um, so I think that taking a bigger picture look at nutrient cycling is is the the important takeaway from today. And I'm going to start with something um, pretty simple. Um, Peter, can you pull up the soil uh, pyramid, please? All right. So audience, what's missing from this? Let's start there. We got clay, silt, sand, what's missing? And it's a big piece. And this, this goes back to my bitch with, with soil science and the fact that we are still using something that we, I would say, brought to the masses, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, so I'll answer the question because I don't see any chats going. Uh, it's organic material. Thank you, brother. We refer to organic matter or organic material, but you know, that is this, this is a picture of dirt, right? Uh, Clay, silt, and sand mixed together. But that's dirt. That's not soil. Um, if you do not have organic matter, you will not have a much life or, or you'll have extremely low nutrients cycling. So, you know, again, it's the, you know, the dogma that, that is preventing people from really wrapping their head around what is nutrient cycling. So now let's, let's scope in a little bit. Um, Bacteria are the basis of every thing that's living. Um, without without that simple little bacteria, you you can't build um, more advanced uh, life forms. So what does that little bacteria do? Well, it builds biofilm um, for a number of reasons. Most importantly, it is to protect itself. So as it uh, oozes out or leaks out its its glues um it bonds these little particles sand silk clay and organic matter together to form microaggregates and we've we've talked at length about this um but i think what what's not being discussed at that level is well what is actually happening with the bacteria when they when they eat something are they also excreting something and the answer is yes um, so they, in, in their own essence, are a micronutrient cycling system. Um, so yes, they're, they're excreting biofilms, but they're also excreting wastes. And who's, who's, who's picking up the waste? You know, that's, that's where it starts to get really complicated because there are other organisms that are consuming those waste streams, um, you know, other bacteria. And again, you know, I, I don't want to look at this like a reduction of science. I want to look at this as interdisciplinary. In other words, there are billions of different species of bacteria working in unison to um, begin the phase of, of nutrient cycling. And so we'll take this single bacteria as an example, and it, it has set up on a, on a microaggregate and it's mining whatever it doesn't matter mining something from the silt mining something from the clay mining something from the organic matter and basically um putting that in its pantry in its in its uh its storehouse so that if for some reason the environment has changed uh ph brian brought up ph is a a great example um so the ph has changed based on the plants exudates 
Um, so this particular bacteria is now finding itself in a place where its nutrient that it was mining is no longer available because it's been bound up, but other nutrients are being mined by other biology or bacteria. Um, so what does it do? Well, it goes into its pantry and it pulls out uh, a specific compound or, or mineral um, to adjust its pH so that it can continue to operate. So this is where it gets really complex is that these tiny little interactions between the bacteria are creating environments, microenvironment where they can survive <coughs> or thrive <coughs> or continue doing the work that they're, they're doing, which is, you know, again, nutrient cycling. So next level, predators come along. Oh, who's that, my friend? What's up? Mr. Russ, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> how are you guys? Oh, doing well, brother. I'm so happy you could join us today. Come on, folks. Yeah. He wants to be a party of this. Um, so it's, then rare, then it's rare seeing you without a hat on, dude. You're usually the, the hat every day club. Yeah, I cut my hair. So. I was going to say, you right definitely on, did your fucking hair. Uh, I had, I got a lot of uh, business. It's that, Car it's that Carter Creek influence on you, the clean cut <laughs> look. Well, it's really the fact that Dr. George was like, look, if you're going to be meeting up with mayors and all these other people, you need to, you need to be clean cut. You need a suit and a nice watch for the, for the occasions, you know, so. I second the nice watch, man. That shit. People look at that shit in business meetings all the time. Shoes, your Shoes watch. Shoes and watch. Nice yeah. suit. So, you got to do it if you want to progress, I guess. So, I've just got, got a lot of, lot I'm working on. Fantastic. All right. Well, this is going to be fun now. So, obviously, Brandon, we're talking about the nutrient uh, cycling system for a lot of individuals. If they don't understand that, um, it's kind of hard to trust the process. They understand that Mother Nature is out there feeding things. But how, uh, how would they be able to incorporate that and also understand to build their soil systems indoors? Uh, I, I personally feel like you need to understand as best you can the way Mother Nature operates. And that's kind of the, the basis of uh, our talk today. Yes. Yeah, so, you know if you were looking at things from a holistic point of view and we're looking at fertilization, which is cellular nutrition, you know, um, these things are operating on such a small scale. The way that we think of it is a little bit differently. I think sometimes and they're actually operating. And so we, uh, we visualize ways that we can understand it. I mean, that's, that's how I, I think about things um, and visualize things. Um, so these these scales are real small, first of all. Um, and in these organic systems, there are a couple things that are always happening in real time, and that is your your cycling things like carbon, nitrogen, uh, and phosphorus per particularly. And nitrogen and phosphorus are macro elements that are needed in larger quantities than most of the other elements and because they can become both quickly unavailable um, and be utilized quickly if the rate that they're being absorbed isn't isn't being released in, in enough uh, quantity then the system starts to slow down the plant isn't able to acquire all of the, all of what it needs and you know you've seen, you guys have seen the laws of max uh, maximum right the laws of minimum like your your most limiting factor will you know cause you know a slowdown in in plant growth and health exactly you're you're always subject to your limiting factor trying to minimize that or remove that factor yep so if we let's talk about um, like nitrogen cycling for a second, right? So if we're looking at if we're looking at the uh, cycle of nitrogen, we have atmosphere. You know, seventy eight percent of our atmosphere atmosphere is nitrogen, but it's in an unavailable form. Plants can't use this nitrogen, and so what has to happen is it has to be nitrified, and it happens through nitrification through different types of microorganisms where they're able to use an enzyme and convert 
uh, NO2 into, or N2 into uh, ammonia, NH4. And then that's converted into um, uh, ni uh, nitrite. Nitrite. And, and then, then that's converted into uh, nitrate. And nitrate and ammonium are both available to the plant. And then they have to take up that and then convert it into amino acids and then into proteins. Um, uh, amino acids are also an available form of nitrogen for the plant. But what happens is this nitrogen is also denitrified by denitrifying bacteria. So there's nitrifying bacteria and denitrifying bacteria. And so this thing is constantly happening where if you have nitrogen in your system in an organic form, it doesn't ne necessarily mean that all of the stuff that you put in there is going to be bioavailable. Some of it will be utilized by microbes and mobilized to different parts of the soil. And it's actually called immobilization, which is kind of funny because what happens is the microbes immobilize it by sequestering it. But at the same time, if it's a, a flagellated, you know, microbe, for instance, they might go and move through that system into a different part, um, maybe, and they might die next to the rhizosphere. And then the, the, the mineral nutrition that was associated with the breakdown and release of that can then be available in an area that's right next to the root, right? But some of that nitrogen that is converted will also off-gas into atmospheric nitrogen. And so it's a constant cycle. And you have to think of this happening in real time. So you have... You know, let's that it's one of the importance, like in these living systems that you take a large amount of your bio waste. And I was I made a video about this. You know, I do leaf tissue analysis and a little over five percent uh, by by um, weight of that material is nitrogen. And so it's going to be a slow release. It's going to take bacteria, enzymes. It's going to take moisture to be able to break that down and release, a, you know some of that nitrogen in a bioavailable form. It'll also break down into amino acids too, which will be utilized by the biology in the soil. It'll be able to be used by the plant in the soil. But it, it's, you know, you're getting as, you're trying to get as much into that system, back into that system as you can, right? And that's why with these like living organic systems, Especially if you have beds and larger volumes of soil, you have this like living mulch where you're taking off all the stuff that you're pruning, you know, and putting it in the system. Now, if you have an issue with your having insects or some, something, I don't recommend that, right? I recommend mulching that and then fermenting it. All that stuff will die in that process. But being able to just put that right back into the system will give you that cycling process, right? Where you have the material in there and it's also cycling carbon as well because carbon is a different cycle that is similar to the nitrogen and carbon is really interesting because it acts as both a transport catalyst it acts as uh, you know for mineral nutrition it also um, it has it slowly releases so all of the the mineral nutrition that's in organic material, it means that it's attached to carbon. So it's in some type of chain, you know, whether it's a polysaccharide from something like, um, like, uh, you know, leaf material, like um, the, what the uh, uh, leaf is made out of, you know, cellulose, uh, that'll degrade. And as those chains, those molecular chains that are creating these like, you know, three-dimensional structures they degrade on a molecular level and they release you know those polysaccharides are made out of proteins and a protein is carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and so as those groups are being broken down it's releasing carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and that nitrogen into the system and so the biology is utilizing this and then other things are happening like that hydrogen that free hydrogen can be you know, those elect that elect they can it can transfer right to another element and 
you know, assist in like redox or oxidation potentials, you know, depending on whether it's oxygen or hydrogen. So the breakdown of organic matter or the breakdown of carbon chains, it releases the mineral nutrition, but also you get functional carbon groups like carboxylic acid. And carboxylic acid, again, it works as a transport catalyst, transport the, the, the inorganic elements that plants need for growth. And it, and it keeps them in, in a biologically available form. Um, carbon is kind of the same thing, right? There are two tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. It gets, uh, it gets placed into the soil differently. Most of our carbon is coming from biological material, either waste like manures, from animals, um, from animals themselves, or from you know, green, green waste, you know, like leaves and stuff, but also from root aches, root exudates, right? Photosynthate that are, you know, the plant's main function is again to take, you know, carbon dioxide and to take water. You see, take carbon dioxide and water and create these carbon, hydrogen, oxygen compounds, these organic chemicals, and the majority of these chemicals, complex carbohydrates, amino acids, proteins, whatever they are, they get pumped back down into the soil system through the uh, phloem. And that's another way that biology increases. And it also helps change um, pH ranges. So that way more, new, uh, you know, like it, it could decrease pH or create or dump something like iron reductase to reduce iron into a bioavailable metabolically available form so this type of stuff is always happening but those but that carbon cycling it's very very important because that carbon they have these functional groups that hold the minerals in a place that's what the, your pure humic, humic and pure fulvic acids do that's what your humate substances do and they also act um as a source of energy for the microbes now that's essentially what carbon carbon is it's energy and you kind of think about what we use for fuel hydrocarbons right it's because the the energy that's produced from the separating of hydrogen and the carbon creates energy so the same thing happens it, you can think i think of carbon like a battery you know it has these negative and uh positive uh, poles that hold on to anions and um, and and cations, you know, anions and cations, anion, cation, tomato, tomato. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and, I, I always wonder about the pronunciation of cation or cation. Cation. I was gonna say, I hear the really smart ones say cation, cation exchange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, everybody has that issue. When I first started, I used to call them the same thing, cations or, or cations. And they're like, no, it's pronounced cations. I think you're right, Brandon. Tomato, tomato. You know, whatever. Yeah. As long as you understand what it's about. Exactly. Um, yeah, so that's a really important. And when we're talking about what is organic, we're talking about things that haven't been broken down on, you know, they're, they're – you know, carbon's like Legos. They build up, they build things, right? They build our three-dimensional live uh, world around us. And so the breaking back down of that, that releases the, some of that mineral nutrition. But when you're talking about crops in general, you're still taking a large uh, mass out of that soil each time, right? Well, your, your biomass for your flower and usually your stems and stalks. And so you still... You still have to be able to replace that if you want to um, have the same result all the time, right? You have to figure out a way to get that back into the soil. And that's why I use, you know, organic amendments, things like gypsum and um, some of the mineral sulfates, stuff like that. Layton, do you want to add on that? Or? Oh, yeah. Well, I, yep. you know, he's doing a wonderful job. I don't want to <laughs> fucking interrupt. <laughs> it's beautiful. I mean, carbon is the foundation of, of everything, like you said. And it builds these incredible bonds and chains, and only the bacteria um, can break them apart and, and release. And then, then they reform into other things. Like 
one thing you started to touch on, um, but I think is important to understand is that, yeah, when that hydrogen is released, it can very easily bond to oxygen to become, become water vapor, which is part of this whole cycling thing that's going on in, in your aggregation. Um, you know, that's why it's so important that you do have good soil aggregates because you're never going to get good nutrient cycling if you don't have that environment there for them. And my dog's out of control. So Brandon, keep going while I shut him up. Um, yeah. So there's, you know, chemistry and biology are inherently the same thing at different scales, right? And so they coexist in these systems. They coexist because chemistry has a huge impact on how biology functions and then biology and the, the chemical products that they produce affects the, the things around them as well. So um, you, when you're looking at it from that perspective, you have to understand that, well, you might have, um, you know, a solubilizing bacteria. Let's say you have some bacillus species, bacillus megatherum, for instance, it's well known uh, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria that has PGR properties, plant growth, uh, PGPR or PGP properties, plant growth, plant growth promoting properties. And the reason that they, they do that is because it's able to solubilize phosphate, phosphate from inorganic mineral sources of phosphorus. However, just because you have enough biology in your soil to do that doesn't necessarily mean that that phosphate would, is going to be available to plant. Because if you have really, really high calcium levels or really high iron or really high copper or really high zinc, really high manganese, those things can affect the availability of that phosphate because that phosphate is an, is an anion and it can bond with a lot of these other uh, cations. And come and they'll precipitate into uh, different chemicals that aren't available to the plant. So we're not only just looking at biology, but we're looking at, at least for myself, when I'm looking at these systems, I'm also looking at balance. Because if you don't have things in the right ratio, just because you have the right bacteria or microbes, doesn't it? You know, you have to have homeostasis throughout the system. You have to have home homeostasis within the microbe populations. And then you have to have homeostasis within your your nutrient profile as far as the, the sufficiency and the quantity and the balance of those. Oh, so well said. And, and you know, again, the the understanding of organic compounds and this goes back to, you know, something we've touched on recently, which is more, uh, again, bigger picture like these bio geo chemical reactions are so complex and everything is in such flux that it's you know very easy for them to get out of line but but again what what i think the most important takeaway what brandon's trying to explain here is that not only do you need to have the the correct or or uh, available nutrients but you've got to have the biology as well or you're never going to get those reactions and you're never going to hit your potential I mean, you can yeah. feed the plant all you want, but if you're not having those, you know, really important biogeochemical reactions, you're never going to get again to full plant potential expression. Yeah. It's it's really weird because there's like a balance that's achieved through physics, through chemistry, and through biology, right? Because the physics part is operating on an even smaller scale. And those are things like electron transfer of ions between uh, molecules to create, you know, positively or negatively charged, or even to add charges on, which changes, you know, the availability of these molecular elements. And there's that going on. And then there's the, mo the new molecules that are being built. There's things that are being taken, you know, that are being catabolized in soil. So there's just, it's, it's, and it's real time. The stuff is happening in real time. And I, you know, so you got to think about how the, the functionality of everything as, as a whole. It's super complex. It's really and, complicated. and yeah. And I think that, you know, breaking it down into like, if you go all the way down to electron transfer and shit like that, it gets fucking deep quick. And so, you know, I think that the, the, the easier approach to it is understanding like, you know, the individual 
components like bacteria and what they were doing. And, yeah. you know, and I've always been deep, had deep respect for you, uh, Brandon, for what you've done with targeting specific bacteria to do the work instead of trying to shotgun and take the whole community. I'm, I've been all about communities. Like that's why when I make my product, I'm using fish waste, worm castings, yeah. biological compost that I made combining them together using uh, force to strip everything apart um, and then concentrate it. So similar to the way hash is made, say dry sift, you're not yeah. taking all the plant material. You're just taking the part that you're really looking for. So um, in understanding that, you know, I've had tremendous successes with, with using, you know, all three of those pieces to produce something that does have the incredibly diverse biology and then throwing it into play and letting, letting nature, letting the system um, gel and figure out what, what it wants to survive and what it doesn't. But, you know, for you and what you've done, um, Brandon, is just incredible because you've, you've literally targeted certain types of biology to do the work. And, you know, there was something I always wanted to ask you is like, do you have protozoan infusion of any kind in your, in your biological systems? God, I'm going to take in a bong hit <laughs> or a bowl. <laughs> So, so here's the thing, right? There are kind of two different modes of thought too. When I approach the type of system that I'm looking at, if I'm looking at a true organic system, which has over 20% organic matter, like these peat based or these modified living systems that we manufacture versus agronomic soils, because I take a completely different approach to the agronomic soils. The target levels are a lot different the mineral nutrition that's in those look a lot different and it's because they function differently. They function dramatic. They, it's dramatic. The difference in a peat based system versus um, a actual mineral soil and having a larger presence uh, and larger biodiversity in these agronomic soils is, is spot on. And the reason is because you have, you have, your chemical profile, your nutrient profile, and your and your organic matter profiles are going to be vastly different, right? Because you're going to be really, really consistent typically in these peat-based systems because your temperatures aren't really fluctuating very, very much. Your relative humidity isn't your your hydrology of that soil, and then also what's going into that soil. So you're going to be able to inoculate and use these same types of microbes continually to get the same effect over and over and over in an agronomic soil we don't have the luxury of telling mother nature that it's time to rain or telling it that it's time to stop raining and so the way that these soils react strictly on these abiotic stresses from the environment change it very drastically the chemical makeup and what becomes available in agronomic soils. It's so it's a, it's a, you know, I take a completely different approach and I would use things like compost teas and extracts and different types of compost in agronomic soils, because typically we're looking at on a good piece of arable agriculture land, maybe 5% organic matter, but in realistic right now, our soils that are currently being used for commercial crop production are about one, if we're lucky, if we're lucky, maybe 2%. And that's, that's 2% is the top end. Uh, that's where our soils are at. And really you need five to 7% to really have a fertile soil of organic matter as a total mass on the first, you know, six inches of, of soil, of topsoil where most of the nutrient cycling is happening in these agronomic soils. Um, so yes, biodiversity is really important. And also, you know, the approach is a little bit different too. I wanted to kind of add to this with the topsoil. I've heard Dr. Lane Ingham talk about how she, you know, it could take a long time. I've heard some people say hundreds of years, hundred years. Uh, some people disagree with that, Layton. Is it, 
Is there um there we go? That should be better. Is the toe popping up too, dude? Hey man, what wrong up, one. Man? I'm sorry, guys. I'm oh, sorry. Man. They got they got me on the other channel and I, I keep popping in here. I'm sorry, fellas. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> you like, have a good day. I was like, like Brandon popping in. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> I was hanging oh, on oh, Tuesday shit. night too. Um so so back to that question, and, and I think the answer is she's right, because literally to get organic matter back to a level of fertility, and there's a lot of people arguing this, whether fertility is, is 10% organic matter, 8%, I've heard as high as 20%. Um, in some of the projects I engineered um, with soil blending, I went 20% with organic matter, and I actually had um, issues with it. Um, it got very gummy the soil did it was like it, it it held too much moisture and again i attribute that to the type of organic matter i used um, i should have been more heavy on the wood chips and less heavy on the compost and then i could have achieved that 20 percent organic matter without it going gummy um so you know there's there's a lot to uh to 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 looking at say a prairie system a prairie system built up for hundreds maybe thousands of years of soil transportation because remember all soils are created through transportation wind or water one or the other or or a major event uh, you know landslide volcano whatever so that being said in an undisturbed system that's not being tilled or or fertilized or anything yeah it's going to take hundreds of years yeah. if not longer for that organic matter to build up to that level of fertility and i'm talking about all organic matter roots yeah. You know, and you're really talking so. about in a in a completely 100% self-sustained natural ecosystem, then yes. But if you have people intervene and you're able to use science to look at how much organic matter, what the nutrient content looks like, and then you're able to address that where you go and add your organic matter, you do a, a disking and a tilling for your first year, and then you start doing um, – you know, agronomic practices like crop covering, chop, chop and drop, yeah. um, uh, doing multi-species cropping, and then you start introducing your, you know, earthworms and, and you utilize you bio waste recycling and uh, putting uh, your carbon back into your soil. Because we can be carbon, we can build actually be carbon positive, right? And the way that we do that is by returning the majority of the biomass because the majority of the carbon that's in that plant, which is the majority by weight of what the plant is made out of as far as a nutrient goes, is carbon. Um, we can be carbon positive because the majority of that carbon came from the atmosphere, right? And so what we're doing is by putting that biomass into the soil, we're, we're creating organic matter. That's the definition of organic matter is, is molecules that are attached to carbon. So we put that carbon back into the soil by implementing these different types of ag practices while stimulating the biology. The biology creates organic acids and enzymes and creates new soil from the inorganic mineral elements that are already in the soil. And then you just address as you're building this system, the nutrient stuff that you need as you go. And you can do that through knowing that if, hey, you have... You, you know that you have specific crops that need higher amounts of potassium, right? And you don't want to have to apply, uh, you know, like any type of potassium mineral or you don't want to have to obviously no chemicals, but you know that you have access to a high potassium compost. You know, you can apply your high potassium compost and get the mineral nutrition that you need from it. But it's just it's about building that soil up. And then maintaining that soil fertility through the right types of agricultural practices. And that's going to be, look at, it's going to be used, using biostimulants for the, the future of agriculture looks like this. It's carbon-based fertilizers, biostimulants, and microbes. I, I already know because across the world, it's, it's already changed. We're, as far as agriculture on an industrial agriculture goes here in this country, we are, we, we are one of the largest producers and exporters, but we're still behind on the, the technology as far as as far as implementing what we already know.
I heard somebody explain it really well where they're saying, you know, other countries are banning Roundup and stuff like that. Our country is, you know, trying to ban that they're going to put that on the label. I mean, it's just a different mindset altogether with with what it really takes to, to farm uh, nutrient dense food and nutrient dense medicine. Yeah. And be careful what you read, too, because contrary to that, um, most countries haven't banned Roundup, you know. And, and the reason I know that is because I looked into it. Because a lot of the stuff that you see and, and hear about, it could be, it could just be, it could be fake news. Even when it comes to ag stuff. I so I looked into it and Monsanto is still headquartered in Germany and they still use a lot of those products. But it's up to the consumers, right, and the farmers who actually utilize those products to be educated to know what they can use that is going to have uh, – great efficacy it's not and it's going to be cost effective because that's a that's that's the bottom line right is they want something that's not going to cost too much that's going to work and so you have to be able to provide them another option and again biostimulants are biostimulants um you know organic pesticides microbes organic you know like blueberry bassiana things like that uh, th these are going to be able to help. You know, if you crop cover, you don't have to use Roundup because you're not going to get a bunch of weeds. They, they don't have a place to take foothold, you know. So it's just about education and implement in the implementation of, you know, the, the collective knowledge that we possess to create closed loop systems. That's, that's what the future of agriculture is going to look like. And, you know, I'd love to hop in here, too. Is, and I think that um, the piece that's not being discussed right now is that a lot of these countries, they don't have the economics to be able to afford to buy all these fertilizers. I'm, I'm working with a farmer, um, you know, in Illinois right now. And he's like, the price of nitrogen is, is just ridiculous. And, you know, the price of Roundup is not no joke either. And so... You know, when I traveled to Greece, I ate the most incredible food I've ever had in my life. Everything was so bursting with flavor and texture. And I felt so healthy um, after probably five days of just consuming it. And I was started to ask questions like, well, how is this stuff grown? And they're like, we just we just do traditional agriculture. And I'm like, well, what does that look like? And it's like, well, we use manure as fertilizer that system functions we we here in america because the vast majority of our agriculture is owned by monster corporations and no longer individual farmers they have the power to buy on on scales that's that's mind-bending and they don't really care about the soil or the nutrient density it's about bottom line and so that's the real big difference between i want to say world agriculture versus uh, american agriculture and we've stripped our soil of organic matter to the point, like you were saying before, one one percent if you're lucky, which is horrifying, um, considering that that is the foundation of healthy soil. And so, you know, the foundation of nutrition as well, because then that organic matter is responsible for holding on to the to the minerals that the plant takes up that end up in our bodies. Right. Exactly. And it's also protects the minerals from being washed away. It makes them immobile, holds them in place in situ so that the biology can break it down and make a plant available. So again, organic matter is, is probably one of the most important parts of that whole uh, CC nitrient, uh, nutrient cycling system. Because if you're holding those nutrients uh, close to the, the plant's roots, then the, the plant can access them when the roots come in contact with them. But if they can't, then that stuff washes away into the system, washes or washes out of the system, washes into streams, rivers, groundwater. And we all know where that shit goes and the problems that those are creating. So how do we fix that? Yeah, and I think cover cropping and more importantly, instead of tilling and disking, you, you do what's called a crimp and roll and then drill seed. Now you, you've, you've not spent nearly as much energy pushing that organic matter into the soil. You're actually using it as a mulch to, to suppress 
indicator plants. I hate the word yep. weed <laughs> because they're all, all plants are functioning, doing something. And those weeds are pulling out, they're telling you something. And they're also trying to fix that soil by pulling nutrient that the soil desperately needs out and bringing it to the surface so that when they die, they're going to be there for the microbes and the next secessionary plants to come and play. So all of these methods are so important in, you know, especially scale agriculture. If you're, if you're an outdoor grow and you're, you're growing hemp in, you know, 20 acre, 30 acre, 100 acre plots, you need to start practicing these things because otherwise you're no better than the corn and soy growers, which are just strip mining the, what's left of the soil, leaving it bare. So it's, it's going mobile. It's getting picked up by the wind or washed away in, in rain events. And so, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of fucking work to do and we are way behind the rest of the world as far as this is concerned. And I mean, look at China, look what they're doing. They're not, they're not frigging screwing around over there. They've, they've come to understand and respect uh, the soil on a level that we, we need to catch up with. And, and they're, that's, using, they're using uh, carbon-based fertilizer over there. Yeah, exactly, dude. Exactly. And I, the word biostimulant, I don't think people understand what biostimulant means. Biostimulant can be biology. You could just make a, a, a brew of compost tea and throw that on the soil. That whatever's in those organisms will be consumed by other organisms and therefore boosting the overall system that's present, that's functioning. Yeah. You know what? I, uh, I posted a book called Biostimulants in Agriculture just recently on my IG, part of like one of this, you know, just a series. I have tons of books I've been sharing. And um, it talks about all different types. Uh, I talked about phytohormones. It talks about uh, high, uh, protein hydrolysates. It talks about kelp meal. It talks about humic and fulvic acids. It talks about all these different things, exactly what's happening. Um, it goes through a list of all the experiments that they ran things like cytokine and, and the ability of phytohormones to redirect the signaling so that the plant grows a different way or that it actually stimulate you know cytokine and actually stimulating uh, cell division and kind of uh, priming these these go signals they call them go signals where um, it tells the cell that it's time to divide and so it has some of these have, you know, just as, you know, uh, efficacious usage as chemical fertilizers. And so that's what we're seeing with a lot of, you know, I've, you know, I've been talking about amino acids forever, but there's like more and more information all the time coming out on that. Um, and again, it's just, there's so many different ways that we can approach things that we now how to. So it, it will change. It's just a matter of the, the right people stepping up to actually create these systems, implement in, implement them and you replicate it. Agreed. And, and you can take it even deeper into folding proteins. You know, if the, if the, if the cell itself has the correct ingredients and it can fold proteins in different ways to have different reactions. Yeah. And, and yeah. The chemical signaling shit fucking gets crazy really quick. The ability for a mycorrhizae spore, and I'm just going to use this as an example to know which way to grow in the soil to find that plant root. I mean, it can grow in any one direction, thousands of different directions, but yet more often than not, it figured out where to grow so that it would find that root and then become uh, symbiotic with that plant. That's chemical signaling in soil. Um, so yeah, get, this shit gets fucking deep real quick. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're talking about coding, you have to think too that gene transcription on those levels um, are highly affected by stress factors and the availability of the nutrition because the, the proteins will code and they'll downrate if they are in a chaotic environment or if they don't have all of the proper things they need. But if they do have everything they need and they're in a kind of a state of homeostasis, a good environment, and there's no stress, they'll upregulate the gene transcription and that's how you maximize the genetic potential of these things is by giving them things that they need. now if you do want to talk about organic compounds that plants can utilize amino acids 
are one of those things. There's some low weight molecules and they, uh, they can be, um, they can be absorbed through, um, passive diffusion. So it doesn't require any energy, but they have protein channels that will actually take in these, um, these low weight molecules like amino acids and some of these amino acids are attached to other minerals so they get they drag in the whatever they're you know chelating in with them and they'll utilize the they'll utilize the mineral and take that amino acid that skeleton or they'll utilize the amino acid and take that carbon skeleton and they'll recycle those and they'll use them for other processes biomechanical processes on a cellular level, right? And so one of the things that that book that I mentioned, it talks about the the ability for the amino acid, you know, which is, a, they all have a nitrogen molecule associated with the amino group. So it brings in the, uh, the nitrogen that can be utilized if it needs to be broken down or they can just synthesize proteins from the amino acid and then Again, some of these amino acids are precursors for some of these other metabolic pathways as well. So you start stimulating some things like flavonoids and terpenes and other chemical substances just by having the presence of these, right? And so the plant will start processes if there's something to process. But if there's nothing that a process, it doesn't have it, it, you know, it doesn't do anything, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're, you're talking about plant potential or of genetic expression, and you're right. And again, that's where I think that the living soil systems have, or living soil growers have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that when you're growing in an organic system versus a synthetic system, you're going to get reactions or minor cannabinoid expressions or flavonoid expressions that aren't, aren't present in, in that purely synthetic driven system. So yeah. you know, again, those are such such important factors when you're looking at, you know, these bigger systems. Is that, yeah, you can break them all the way down to these releases on a on a you know metabolite level, but at the same time, there's a bigger picture that there's all this shit that's going on in between. And I love how you you mentioned that you know some of these things are plant available, um, even though for the most part, uh, the powers that be say that only microbials can break down and make things plant available and or biology it's, protozoa. it's not just that too you know water hydrology oh, wow. plays a huge a huge um part of it as well so some of the chemical processes aren't just stimulated through biology but they're stimulated through changes in ph and also stimulated through you know water evaporating or coming into the system you know, water is a universal solvent, and so it has an effect on the chemical composition of elements. Spot on, dude. Again, biogeochemical reactions. They're, they're, it gets fucking crazy really quick. And remember, everything's in flux. So it could be this way this minute and somewhere different in another minute. Um, and I, But again, I think that it's important, you know, being that this conversation is about nutrient cycling is that we – we do hit on the biology and back to back to my question earlier. Do you do you infuse any protozoa in your in your present growing system in Oklahoma? No, I don't actively introduce anything except the mineral nutrition that's needed to keep things sufficient and then the microbe plus. That's really the only the only thing that I need is to keep this uh, sufficient. I, I use the Humate fertilizer too, because you add a large amount of bioavailable carbon. And so what happens is because you're adding this in, what, what happens is all of those inorganic micro and macro elements, they're not just used by the plant. They're used by the microbes in the soil as well. And so when you have the combination of available carbon because you know plants utilize carbon through their stomata and there are some instances where they can take up carbon monoxide through their roots um however um 
the the microbes in the soil they can utilize carbon sources that are already present in the soil so when you're introducing a carbon source that is already attached to an element that they can utilize it's like a it's a win-win so what happens is you start stimulating the biology with the availability of that nutrient so they it's like it's like feeding the biology when you're feeding the nutrient too you're they're you're stimulating biology and you're stimulating the plant at the same time. And that's one of the reasons why, like in China, they use these products because they're able to build up their soil with it, right? They're able to start stimulating the biology, get that organic matter back in there. And so my approach has been to use the uh, living soil method where you have your nutrient cycling, you're adding your um, material back into your system you're utilizing microbes and earthworms and then you and then I'm also collecting data to make sure that the soil is sufficient and when I'm when I'm adding my top dresses I'm not adding a ton of stuff like I'm I'll add you know maybe like I think last time it was 7 milliliters of total combined nutrient and that was I think calcium, there was uh, Epsom salt in there. I think it was some potassium sulfate in there and maybe a little bit of iron or something like that. And it wasn't much. So I'm using just a very small amount of mineral to keep things balanced and sufficient. I'm adding in that carbon sources. I'm adding, and that helps also break down that leaf material that's in there because you, when you stimulate the biology, you stimulate the speed at which those things are breaking down. You know, hydrology, temperature, moisture also play a huge part of it. But having biologically available carbon sources increases the the uh, the populations and therefore the the time that things break down and cycle. Yeah, and again, this is why I'm so fascinated by your approach. And you know, the, Michael Hinden, uh, God rest his soul, uh, beautiful spirit. Um, he and I are playing together with something that. Brandon's talking about, and these are low EC fertilizers. So are they salt-based? Yes, there were some salt-based uh, components to his solution. Although but you have to think, but here, okay. So, so let's talk about salt just real quick. So salt is, it, by definition, what a salt is, is something that a, a cation that's attached to an anion that in water, they defuse, they break apart, right? That's not necessarily... Uh, that's not bad for soil biology, right? Because you have two different molecules in two different forms that are both available, right? What what happens is with these other fertilizer, fertilizers, they're bringing in things like chloride and things like sodium and things like heavy metals and other chemical components that ca can contaminate those systems mm -hmm. and kind of hinder the biology. So having, you know, iron sulfate or gypsum right gypsum is technically a salt right because it's a it's calcium attached to a sulfate but however however that sulfate is beneficial to both microbes and plants and so is that calcium so by introducing that into the system it's not necessarily bad so i just wanted to be clear that so people understand the difference between just a salt and then something like sodium or something like chloride or something like bicarbonate is actually antagonistic to the nutrients that are in that soil or things like, you know, like chloride or, um, or, uh, like, you know, uh, pesticides that could potentially harm the biology in the soil that slow the cycling processes down. Thank you for clarifying that. You're right. And that's why traditionally, uh, salt, salt based growers had to dump their soil every season because it was just so toxified with, with all of those other uh, salt related um, yeah. compounds. And, and, and not to mention that those are also lethal to protozoa and fungi and those, and we're going to get into those in a minute, but, but back to, back to the work that Michael did, Michael proved that you can use these low EC, uh, which would be so low that when we brought Eric Highfield on, he's like, you can't grow cannabis in this. Well, you can if you have the biology working in conjunction with the low EC. The low EC is providing a certain level of, of uh, chemistry. And again, it wasn't all salt-based. He had 
uh, hydrolysate in there. He had uh, fulvic acid in there. He had humic acid in there. So there were other components to the solution other than the little bit of salt-based fertilizers that he blended in. <clears throat> when I used this um, side by side in compost, I actually saw an increase in fungi um, and increase in protozoic production. So that was very mind opening. And, and, you know, it goes back to some of the, the early work I did with, with Elaine. She always said, whatever you do, do not allow biology to be blended with um, salt-based fertilizers. And so the first thing I did was I tried <laughs> and she was right to some degree that, that, that at the right levels, you'll kill it. Whereas it, just depend, it depends on what it is. And, and the thing is, if you're using something like DAP or MAP, right, diammonium phosphate or monoammonium phosphate, those are uh, synthetically created salts. And what happens is once they actually go into water, they separate, but because of their ionic forms, the way that they react, you put something like diammonium phosphate into uh, an agronomic soil system and then it starts tying up all of the iron and the manganese and the copper and it can tie up calcium and then you know you have a fertilizer that's something like uh you know 46 percent or 50 something percent um phosphate and you don't need that much phosphate you need to apply your phosphorus slow and steady that's why biology cycling is cycling is important um over the period of the crop otherwise you're you know the things that aren't available that you just tied up and ends up in our waterway systems and then we end up with things like red algae you know and we end up uh pulling all the oxygen out of the water so fish can't breathe yep which is what we were talking about earlier you know, so the those things, those chemical fertilizers, and a lot of time in those forms, the reason why they're so ineffective is because they immediately react, react with water and then whatever chemicals that are in the, the soil itself. When you, when you have the carbon, it holds on to the molecules, all of those inorganic molecules that the plants need because that's what they're mostly feeding on is inorganic um, elements. And having that carbon in there, that hold it holds on to those in a form that's that's needed. So that's why the the humic and fulvic acids have those biostimulating properties because they they react they they're not reacting. They're staying in a form that both the plants and biology can utilize. And they're chelating too. They're they're releasing that's, some of that organic. Uh, yeah. So it's like you know I think of I think of these carbon groups as like weak magnets where they hold on to the cat cations and the anions and they're they just kind of diffuse back and forth back and forth so there's all there's you know kind of like a cycling process in that itself where you know you can have something def uh, diffused from the surface of a, like an organic uh matter uh, surface or a clay colloid and then something else will take its place and then that'll diffuse and something you know and so it goes back and forth and that's kind of why balance is important too is because what's diffusing into solution into the water solution that the plant is uptaking um is contingent on how much is there like what's diffusing back and forth you want that to be kind of in a balanced solution for the plant and again it's just this is how complex it is it's a fucking seesaw yeah. it's hot it's cold it's hot. practical it's cold. Look, though, you know what's crazy is, though, the practical application for this, it it's not that complex. I mean, it does take a little bit of time to, you know, have all your procedures in line. But as long as you're starting one with a soil that's well built and has high availability of nutrition, good carbon content, you can, in theory, just keep running your material through it right putting all your biomass back in there and not really having to do too much amending but again you have to you will have to compensate for the end product that you pull out yeah well that's always the thing is that and that's the problem with with the cannabis uh cultivation as a whole is that you want the whole plant you know in a perfect world you leave 50 percent of your plant behind to build the fertility for next year's crop but no one's going to do that and the, the other alternative, which has been what we preached forever, is like, okay, take the buds, but return all the stalks, all the leaves, everything you possibly can, because that is the nutrition that plant needs. 
Yeah. But, and you can mulch your stems up and just throw it on, on there as like a mulch, you know? You know, and that's the crazy part on some of the regulatory shit. They don't want you to do that. They want you to, they want to prove that you've destroyed every little bit of this plant that is yeah. not being pushed into the market. The yeah. insanity of humanity. Like, like, oh, if you don't have a bullfrog mitigation plan for your, for your fucking water, <laughs> they're going to come and drain your water in NorCal. If the, you get caught with a fish or a frog in your pond, it's like, I don't know. I, I'm not going to go down that hole, but let's reel it back into to the, the protozoa. Yes. Reel it back into the protozoa. So, you know, in, in the work that I do, which is, you know, very broad, I'm not focused on one specific plant and I'm definitely in a soil system, not in a uh, soilless medium. Um, that the protozoa and the fungal, well, the fungal kingdom represents 50% of the nutrient cycling system. The protozoan uh, represent the other 50% 50 of the nutrient cycling system. So I'm able to achieve 300 pounds of nitrogen release per acre for a 60 day period using a protozoan and fungal based um, inoculant in, in dirt to turn it back into soil to, to get jump started. Um, and so it always means that with uh, laboratory analysis of your soil. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically you send off your, your biology to one of these soil food web labs and they'll basically come back and tell you that the, your, your system has the ability to produce X amount of pounds of nitrogen released naturally in the soil system based on the level of biology. So it's, it's basically a, a, a metric that's used to measure um, the, the release of natural fertilizer. And I, they target N, which they really shouldn't. They should be targeting, you know. Well, it's, standard, no, it's standard for, for in agronomy to see what your nitrogen release yeah, yeah. out of the uh, organic matter percentage that you have. I don't think it's yeah. necessarily the biology, but I think it's the total organic matter percentage and what that should look like over a course of a period of time well yeah but again if you have no organic matter <laughs> yeah you're exactly. trying to put it back in that's that's your only that's, method that you can use to and measure yeah, and your, your your release rate is higher if you have the you know the higher that you have um in organic matter correct but again the foundation of that end release is through biological reactions so fungi mm -hmm. and whereas your system you're you're basically feeding them and then you're feeding the feeding the the the, the met matrix with with both the compound and the bacterial, but you stayed away from protozoan and fungi, which always blew my mind that you could do as well as you've done um, by by regulating the biological component and 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 not allowing it to potentially. Well, what 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 is you know when I when I think about fungal people always say fungal dominant soils. What does that look like? Are you talking about by by mass weight, or are you talking about by cells? Because if you if you were to take and look under a, a scanning electron microscope, all of that fungi is completely covered and dominated with bacteria, mm. right? Because they they live synergistically. So I don't think there's, in my opinion, there's no true like bacterial or fungal dominated soils. I think that these things coexist together depending on the environment. And I do physically see uh, the fungal component, especially with the breakdown of the organic matter like the leaf material. So there is fungal component in the soil. I know, but the reason why I don't actively um, focus so much is because i inoculate with bacteria and fungal components like the trichoderma for instance that's my that's my main fungal component because i'm looking for a direct effect and that's going to be the production of sediophores for iron chelation in these systems because typically the ph doesn't fall to a low enough range to really um get the the levels that i'm looking for on tissue and sap analysis and so introducing that biological component along with the with the mineral component of iron itself can drastically increase 
the data as far as um, how much iron the plant is actually sequestering. So there is fungal components. There's a bacterial component. I don't do much microscope work. In fact, I don't do any microscope work because I wouldn't be able to identify the 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 specific organisms. I could give it get. I could have a general idea of the, of their their um, morphology and things like that, but without genetic analysis, I wouldn't be able to identify them. And what I'm really wanting to know is what their metabolites are anyway. What type of enzymes are they being released? What kind of organic acids? Because that chemistry is going to tell me um, and give me an idea of what's going to be happening with the nutrient cycling capacities of those organisms. Um, now, I know what the nutrient cycling capacity of the trichoderma and the bacillus subtilis combination is, and that's why I use that. It's also why I use the pseudomonas, saccharomyces, and bacillus combination that's in the probiotic stimulant microbe plus from my com company, also known in science as effective microorganisms. Because I can look at the, the metabolites that are produced by these, and in this specific system, these peat-based systems, um, they work best for compensating for what I need that aren't available simply because the soils don't operate in these pH ranges. We're not going through these really great fluxes like we would in agronomic soils with like saturated soils, oversaturated soils where you would get the buildup of anaerobic bacteria, which will actually increase the nitrogen in the soil ammonium, soil ammonia which will then be converted into other biological forms of nitrogen as well as proteins when it enters the plants, amino acid proteins when it enters the plants. So I'm looking at the system as a whole and looking at that component. And, and for this peat-based system, this is the best way that I found to find the functional relationship between the product and the data, right? So I can physically see what's happening. I can physically see the phosphate cycling capacity of the micro plus. I can physically see the high levels of manganese that are released, even when there's low amounts in the soil, I can see the high solubility. So these are things that I'm, I'm looking at from an analytical standpoint and, and the reasons why I continue the same program. Now, when I introduce the humates, what I see is that the availability of all the minerals that are in the soil collectively increase. And then that soil soil actually stays balanced for a longer period of time. So the sufficiency of the nutrient itself increases and then the balance of that of those minerals stay um, stay in, in range for a longer period of time. So again, though, I, you know, it, it's just, it, 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 it's such a really fucking cool approach that, that I have not seen anybody else do. Um, and understanding that, look, we'll just talk about fungi for a minute. So 50% of the fungal kingdom is mycorrhizae. The other 50% is saprobes or, the, or, or we, can get, fights. Yeah. We, can, we can't call them fights anymore because fights means plants <laughs> in Greece, in Greek or in Latin, excuse me. So anyway, the saprobes are, are the other half. And then you've got down the line, you get into the yeast and the molds and the trikes and all of that. So there's, there's quite a bit going on in there. Um, but generally speaking, the, the workhorses are going to be the saps and the microbe. Uh, yeah. The and you can see those in my systems, right? Because those are what's breaking, like physically colonizing the leaf material and breaking it down. And the trichoderma isn't so much breaking down leaf material. It's more throughout the actual soil system around the root. Correct. And so where those saprobes are coming from in your system is actually they came from endophytes. So they were inside the last last runs plants. And when you chopped and dropped, those leaves started to dry up. <clears throat> those endophytes turn into <clears throat> um, saprobes and they start breaking down the leaves. So you're naturally getting these put into the system by your practices, which is really cool. But again, I, I, I'm dying to scope your soil, dude. I'm dying. I have been scope my soil. Yeah. And I, I, but I want to do it again, dude. I, you know, you've, you've increased your, uh, or you've, you've, yeah, I've changed a couple of things. I've introduced the humates and that's pretty much it. But man, I, it's like when we first started using them, we were seeing mushrooms exploding out the sides of the pots and 
So it's it's pretty incredible what you can uh, the results that you see with it. And um, as far as the protozoa, you know, here's the thing with these systems, right? If you see all of this biology and it's happening, you can physically see it. There's going to be protozoa in there, right? It's because there's something for them to feed on. You create when you when you start to build up this soil system and you have you know all this excess carbon and you have access to the mineral nutrition there's going to be protozoa there's going to be nematodes in there going to be you know depending on your temperatures your ph you know there's going to be your bacteria and, and you know ty different types of bacteria and fungi in there too oh yeah so. nature, nature always finds a way yeah but again you know you're you're if you want to jump start dirt into soil then it's kind of important that you do take into consideration that yeah. you know, i'm looking to i'm looking to hit the first run out of the park mm -hmm. i need to introduce these things because they're yeah. not going to be present in that first run and, and when when i was talking about like the bioremediation of ag soils to get it up to sufficiency bring organic matter and you're oftentimes going to be using a really highly fertile or biologically active compost or castings things like that so that just there a lot of these microorganisms when they have limited uh, food or carbon they'll spore late and they'll you know encapsulate their dna and when the time is right they'll re-emerge to reproduce and 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 you get the all that stuff into the soil you're going to be bringing them in there especially because you're promoting all that stuff you start with what's in that substrate and it's going to start spreading as you pra at with your practices, right? More organic matter, more crop cover, more moisture in the soil. All those things start to exponentially increase as that soil fertility gets better. And I wanted to say too, a huge part of soil fertility is structure. It is a massive, massive, massive part. And building soil structure is just as important as building the nutrient profile and the bio biological profile of that soil. Yep, micro and macro aggregates. They're the key to everything. Yep. Um, they're, otherwise your soil's compact, it can't breathe, it, it can't gas off. Uh, biology has to struggle to, to create aggregates um, in that environment. And so, yeah, you're spot on. The, the, the key to that is soil structure. And, and if you're, trying to do this on the first run then you've, you've you got a lot of work to do or or you go you know the approach that you took which was a well, that's school. why I, I recommend the first year let's say you get a, your, your piece of land and you're ready to invest in it and that's i always recommend that you invest into your own land you go and you use the you you can till don't be afraid to like disc until your first year to get all that stuff in there it doesn't mean you need to disc until every year it just means that to start off your project to get this thing kicking off to start building that soil you use you know regular ag practices and then you convert you get your minerals in there you get your you get everything in there you get your organic matter and then you start your chop and drop by growing out crop covers and you year after year you add back in at least a portion of what you're taking out because you like when you think of the biomass of any type of vegetable crop or cannabis so much of it doesn't need to go to the trash or the landfill anything like that it just could put it back in the soil just makes sense agreed 100 percent. and that's that's you know and again you can till or you can you can crep, uh, crimp and roll and that yeah. they, they're the same thing because you remember how soil structure actually looks or, or the profiles, the horizons, whatever you want to call them. You get your organic matter at the top and generally it's very small. Yeah, um, yeah. It and, decreases exponentially the deeper it goes. Yeah, right, definitely. right. Because it's being broken down and reused and recycled in those processes, the seesaws that we were talking about earlier. Most, most people might not even know this, but most agronomic soils, they're looked at at only the first six inches of soil. Other Anything below that, they don't even consider it part of the system in conventional agriculture because that first six inches is where everything is happening. Yeah, I've heard eight, but six, yeah, six, eight, depending on who you're talking to. And, and you're right, they don't. And that's, again, the problem with, with, you know, big ag is that they're not looking yeah. at the whole big picture here.
Yeah, it, uh, it's like this. So for any standard agronomic crop, you're looking at the first six inches of soil and one acre would be approximately two million pounds. And so you're looking at volumetric weight to do measurements to see how much of what you would need to add. Like, so if you had, if you had, um, you know, you need to add a certain percentage of nitrogen or copper, you would know by knowing that 2 million pounds is one acre. So you would do your, your metrics based off of that math. I was hoping we could talk more about you. You briefly spoke on. We've talked about it at the the hustle and educate event, but uh, I hope more of a buzzword for the cannabis community is sidero for tomato tomato kind of thing. Uh, yeah. But when you're talking about the iron chelation, the iron carrier, um, I do believe that that's now moving into that now worlds upon worlds understanding things on a deeper level, and maybe part of that is also how we're starting to achieve more of the full uh potential profile of the cannabis seeds one second i need to get my lighter all right <laughs> what layton what do you uh like so when i first started to understand about the sidero for uh it, it started to kind of make sense because once the utopia is built now everything needs to start moving and grooving you know you're you're farming our guest uh yesterday i thought said it kind of perfectly his goal is to be a high carbon far farmer, you know, and that's kind of what you're doing, right? You're, you're taking that. Yeah. And then once things are developed, diversity uh, is created. That's where it seems like all of a sudden now every little trace mineral is just uh, that much more important because you're trying to create that utopia. Yeah. Well, so go ahead, Russell. You know, it's like a lot of the same minerals that plants are using are going to be utilized by the biology and, trichoderma specifically has the highest affinity for iron which it, it which is which is actually part of its biocontrol properties it's able to sequester iron so much better than most other microorganisms that they simply can't live because it doesn't allow them to feed it's taking all of the food all of the things that it needs for survival and taking it away and a lot of that's how that's part of it that's one of the mechanisms of biocontrol, actually. So when you're able to utilize this iron for your, you know, your processes, whatever's going on, on from a, a biocellular uh, mechanical uh, properties or mechanisms, they're taking in all that iron, but also their metabolites are making it so that iron is bioavailable. Typically, the uh, Fe2 plus, the ferrous form of iron, is what most plants utilize. There are other plants, I think grasses and stuff that can use Fe3, uh, like an oxidized form of iron. Um, but when you're talking about iron, it's very difficult. And I've mentioned this before. Because iron is available at really low and really high pH ranges, um, we're talking about like a system that's at like 5 and below when it starts to really become available. And you can't operate in that range because it's too acidic for the plant. And then a bunch of you end up having a bunch of other issues. So there's like, there's no like real happy medium with iron in these systems. There's no like, there's too much oxygen. There's too much uh, water in these systems. It's very porous. It holds water well. And so iron just doesn't stay in that ferrous form. It, it oxidizes. Um super quick and so this specific microbe keeps it in that form with the production of its metabolites you know and by immobilizing it right consuming it and then once that thing cycles it'll release that and it'll be available again i i just you know, I guess it was kind of like the 80s and then into the 90s and the early 2000s. Since everybody's growing synthetically, a lot of us you know, even growing, trading seeds and clones, uh, that full genetic profile wasn't there. So it makes me wonder what has really been missed after all of these years uh, by understanding more of how the plant desperately needs the, the trace minerals as well. Yeah. Well, iron's really important for uh, protein synthesis. It's also... Uh... It's also a photosynthetic molecule, so it's uh, important for the production of chlorophyll. 
And you need these things, right? Like you have to have magnesium, iron, sulfur, nitrogen. Those are photosynthetic nutrients. They make chlorophyll. They, you know, this pro, this thing that's sitting behind me is a really, it's not that complex of a graph, but it, what, what it represents as far as the, the chemistry and the mechanics of it are intensely mind boggling, you know, the way that it works, you know, so um yep. once I, these little systems are built i mean this is it you're you're just able to take yourself as a farmer to the next level you're able to have, take your attention and, and and time your team's attention just to uh, other issues in the farm uh, by just understanding nutrient cycling understanding that uh, once things are managed that for the most part the, the that whole system should be able to take care of itself on its own yeah well, look at my program is super easy, right? It is mo it's more simple than most programs, and it looks like this. Whether you're in a smaller size pot, it works. I'm in three gallon pots. I'm gonna, I'm hoping that I can crush out 10, uh, 10 peas off this one table under three, uh, under three lights, because it's looking that way. It's looking huge. Only on day twenty eight. So, my boy. He's running all of my, my SOPs too at his facility. He hits two light off a of 480 watt LED. So these things are on par with some of the highest producers in with, uh, you know, synthetics and rock wool or cocoa. Um, but it, it's really simple. You start off with soil and you make sure that soil is sufficient. You get a good, healthy start on veg. And there's something that you have to do, Right. And that's called front loading. And while, while you are in veg, you have to front load calcium and you have to front load nitrogen. You have to maintain sufficiency of phosphorus, potassium, and your micronutrients through veg. Very, very important. But really, you're really pushing nitrogen and calcium. And there's a reason why. Calcium in these systems, it reacts with phosphate. And it uh, precipitates out of solution into an unavailable uh, form. So the calcium and the phosphate become unavailable. So when you transition, there's something that happens in plant. And if you want to have early onset for your flowers, you got to switch up your ratios of calcium and potassium. And so what you do is you pump, you pump up your potassium and you drop your calcium, right? So the plant is going to be uptaking less calcium by probably about 25% um, total volume. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow the plant more access to, to available phosphate because it's not going to react with the calcium in solution because that's one of the main things that's reacting with. Then pushing that phosphorus, uh, pushing up that magnesium is going to also help drive down the calcium availability and increase the phosphate availability. So the combination of increasing uh, potassium, because that's part of your, your base saturation through, for, with your three major, well, four major cations, but, you know, sodium you always want low. Uh, calcium, magnesium, potassium, right? So you keep keep your magnesium where it's at. You decrease your calcium. That hot helps available of phosphorus. You increase your potassium. That helps phosphorus become more available. It's going to help with the onset of flower. Now, your calcium over the period of time will be less. So your plant will can, could potentially suffer, especially if you have like high intense LED lights. You could see calcium deficiencies. But the way to address that for varieties that do that is to re is to readjust your target levels to, and then what you have to do is increase your calcium, increase your magnesium, increase your potassium, and then everything else in that instance when you're really, really pushing hard. But by front loading the calcium, it lets all that stored calcium that's already in the plant, you have it in there. And so you won't have the expression of them trying to, uh, you know, catabolize themselves to get what they need, right? And then you just let that go. You have your 
higher phosphorus, higher potassium through through the rest of your system, uh, through the rest of your cycle. I mean, and that's how you really onset. You have a fast onset of flowering sites, and that's how you kind of push them, and you're just maintaining those levels. Yeah. And all the while, all the while too, you know, you're adding the microbes. But it looks like this, right? So you start with your good soil. You test at the beginning, make sure it's sufficient. You plant. Uh, at the beginning of your cycle, you use something like uh, like 17 and a half milliliters of carbon-based fertilizer and humate just to help get them kick-started, right? And then you would wait. And then when you get to flower, you would do your transition, your complex humate. And you would do that probably once. And then bi-weekly... You use the humate fertilizer, and then biweekly you would use the microbe plus. So let's say one week you would be just water, then you would water in your microbe plus, and then the next week, and then after that, just water until the next week on the you know whatever day you water in your humate fertilizer, and then you just do water and you just transition throughout a cycle like that. And what that helps is both the combination of humates nutrition and biology they all just stimulate a wider array of plant growth um responses and growth you know from obviously from the nutrition but it's stimulating the biology that stimulates organic acid production amino acid production enzyme production it stimulates also some of the plant signaling that's associated with the the um the elements that are in there uh, that are being produced like phytohormones like cytokine and oxygen, gibberellin, because there's microbes that are producing those chemical compounds as well. Yeah, we hope to talk on that further. I've, I've reached out to Leighton on that several times, but that's just uh, a, a, another deep hole that I hope more uh, individuals, the verbiage, uh, more individuals start to understand that stuff and, and try to understand it as best they can. Well, and you get into plant hormones, you get into, again, more complex inner cellular um, activity and, and again it's just such a deep rabbit hole and we know yes. we know so little and yet we're trying to act like you know that we understand these reactions because you start adding a couple hormones together you change it into a whole nother game and so you know it's complicated enough to talk about what we're talking about here Without you know, it, gets deep. it gets really, really deep. And it's like one person will spend their whole life on just one subject. Right. And it's like we're trying to look at things holistically and look at all little. All, we're trying to get many pieces of a lot of different parts. Yeah, you know, exactly. Interdisciplinary instead of reduction. And, you know, I find that, that you um, add microbes every other week or once a month is, is another interesting thing, because. You know, generally speaking, in living soil systems, we we tell people just get it inoculated, get the system rolling, and then you follow these practices. Yes, cover cropping. Yes, chop and drop. Yes, pull all the leaf material, put it right back into the soil system. Chip the stalks, put that back into the soil system, and then you're you're done. You don't need to regularly inoculate. Um, could you use biostimulants, bugs in a jug? Sure, because you know that they're a food source for something. So they're not going to really hurt, but, but I, I'm really interested because you're, you're upping your biology. Um, are you yeah. assuming that you get a die back? And again, that's your part of your nutrient release. Well, you always will have fluctuations in populations and it's going to be contingent again on hydrology, pH, temperature, and moisture. And so some things will are really selective and can only live in, you know, small ranges. Some things have wider ranges they can uh, live and thrive in. The reason why I like to inoculate is because I'm getting the maximum biostimulant activity by doing so. You know, I could let things happen naturally, uh, but by doing the, by mimicking what nature already does and stimulating the system myself, it helps with greater nutrient cycling capacity. And then because it's, not uh, because it's not super expensive, right? The microbes that I sell are really, really inexpensive, especially when you look at all the other products that are out there on the market. You know, you could take something like uh, the microbe spores and make five gallons of liquid concentrate, and it's going to last a long time. 
it's going to last a really long time. And you can even, you can even take that concentrate and you can reintroduce it into a carbohydrate and more water and you can increase the populations, right? Like you can double that even, you know? So it's, it's really cost effective for one. Um, and it's not going to have any, any negative impact on the system. I just like to really get things really kicked off from that, from that, uh, perspective. Cause it, when I, when, when I use this stuff, I see a result, you know, you can see an immediate result. It's good old, again, good old plant reaction it tells the truth about everything. <laughs> again, you know, I've not just myself, but I've sent the, the data off to other people to look at too. And I really associate it to the higher availability of phosphate. And the reason why that's so important, because any type of reaction the plant has that requires energy is going to be in the form of ATP and APT production requires phosphate. That's one of the main the main functions of phosphorus inside of a plant. Yeah, and I love the I love the work you've been doing lately on on introducing people to the information about how these different uh, elements relate to or translate into plant reaction. And, and so big ups and kudos to you for, for getting that kind of information out there. It's complex as fuck, but again, it's another piece of the puzzle. And if you start to put all these pieces together, you can really start to understand some of the, or at least digest some of these extremely complex processes. And I'm, I'm always learning, you know, there's so much there's, I will not ever be able to get all of the information, you know, I, I constantly buy, you know, I buy books and I read through and highlight all the important things that are relevant. A lot of the stuff, it's like, I could read this, I could spend time reading this, but just knowing where it is, if I need it is good enough for now, because if I need to go back to that, I know where it is, where it's at, and I can pull the information, right? So I get books on, you know, a huge plethora of agronomic soil stuff, chemistry, um, cellular biology, everything. And I take, Hey, what's, if I'm looking at something and I need to figure out something, I have to figure out it holistically. So I have to take a different approach usually and see how does just like my data, right? I have a soil, I have saturated paste, I have tissue and I have sap. So take the same approach for everything else as well where i'm looking at the soil dynamics i'm looking at how the how the chemistry plays out i'm looking at how the biology ties in i'm i'm looking at how the the mechanics of how those things are actually being up taken to the plant and if i'm looking at a pathway to see like how one certain thing is manufactured i have to know what manufactured are what are what it's manufactured out of as far as the nutrition and the elements i have to know how much carbon it, 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 it it requires. I have to know how those elements are sequestered by the plant, um, how those elements are cycled in soil. It gives me a, ho a whole point, a whole like view of from the very beginning to the end product. And again, you're pushing, you're pushing these motherfuckers to produce to to yeah, dude, two, two pounds per four hundred and eighty watt light is is a, is crushing dude it's so crushing and when you're getting that those numbers with like four and a half terps and almost 30 percent thc i mean it's it just shows dude you can you can do some amazing things like this what about your uh, minor cannabinoid productions um are you seeing some really good expressions in some of these genetics that you're running yeah it just depends on the varieties and what some varieties will have a wider range of terpenes, and then some of them will just have like bam three that are real high, and then they'll peter off, you know. So it just depends. I personally like the ones that have a wider range. Agreed, hundred percent. Uh, and and a wider range in all of the expressions, all the cannabinoid and cannabinoid expressions. Yeah, and I also, you know, what I really like too is I like to smoke from my head um varieties that also have maybe just three really strong terps but they're 
rare, you know, like osamine, beta carine, um, by bisbital. Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> uh, I'm not stabbing on that one. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I have a variety of very awful. It's hard enough. It's not carifaline, you know, or maricine, or lemonine, or terpenaline. There's these are a lot rare terpenes, and the effect that I get from them is like, like it's just different, you know. Yo, I hear you, man. That's why I like the unusual smokes. I'm not a big, you know, THC chaser. I like THC around 17, 18 percent, but I like all the other expressions to be present, and I, I find it better. I find it it's just more enjoyable. I'm more creative. I'm, you know, more well, thought provoking. I don't know what this other one tested at. I don't. I haven't asked, him, but this DOS funk that I got, I've been smoking on it, and it is. I feel like it's. I know it's got a lot of a uh, high percentage of terps because it it reeks, but I'm pretty sure it's super high in THC too because it really really gets me really high like <laughs> almost almost too high <laughs> you gotta dab some cbd after <laughs> it's different from just uh it's different from concentrates too it's just like a. it's so long lasting too man ah. it's, that's one of the things it's like man i'm still high from four hours ago <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice Peter, what are you doing I, over there? Well, I was trying. I don't know. My camera is frozen, but that—that's from my name is Earl, or Earl Talk. Yes. Yeah. No, oh, I, yeah. I, I gave up. He sent me a bunch of that to give out to people, and uh, the dust funk. Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah. If you have a chance to go on Daga Dot Love and get some of that stuff, highly recommend it, dude. That stuff is fire. Well, no, it's not, not for sale. That dude. That it, dude that dude's work is phenomenal. I have my biggest problem with um, running his stuff is trying to pick which one I want to keep. <laughs> I, I don't know what that's like. A hold on. I think it's Citrus Farmer Times Granola Funk. Uh, hold on, let me. Yeah, no, it's not for sale. It, it's basically I, I was just getting it out into people's hands, and uh, and then uh, recently I reached out to him to be like, if you want to get anything else out, and he, I, I think he's moving, right? I He might be, yeah. Yeah, so he's going to, uh, once he's settled in, but uh, I mean, that's what I like to do. I like like people just doing cool stuff. I like to get it out to other people. And so when yeah. people order stuff, I was sticking his seeds in with it. And uh, so. Oh, that's, anyway. that's awesome. Some people, some really happy people yeah. are going to. Uh, or at least now when you gave it such a, a cosign to it. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, did if did you guys see the uh the high divorce rate? It was featured on the High Times magazine IG page, like I think last year. He also bred that one. And that I mean, talk about beautiful weed. That weed like I know people say this, oh, it's the boxes. Like I rarely really have something that checks all the boxes. But that one was that was that was it for sure. How many different cultivars does this guy have? A lot. Man, he bred some excellent, excellent stuff, and it it wasn't a lot, man. He maybe gave me like he gave me like maybe seven different varieties that he bred, and I grew out, I think like probably five of them, and they were all fire. But also, you know, I got some stuff for I know that some of the people that are uh, in Canada and Mexico all over the world don't have access to my genetics on my website, but they can hit up Daga.love because there is limelight and black light, I believe, still up on the website. Figured I'd mention that. That is that. true. And I, I, I packed up some today. Sweet. Hey, how did you like uh, uh, Brianna's work, Brianna and Michael's work, Modern Epigenetic? Did you run that? Yeah, I did. That runs times Cushman's was fire. Um, I'm a I actually have to see if the cut that I chose got re because I left it at Black Label when I parted ways. Um, let's go back there and see if they if he if it got re-vegged up. Um, it was it was really nice. It grew well. It had a really nice. Um, have a really nice 
flavorful profile. It was kind of sweet and kind of fruity. Um, but the flavor is what really got me because it really kind of tasted like uh, almost like Pez candy to me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it had a really good, this particular variety. And it also had like, you know, nice color and stuff too. Was it a good yielder? Um, I just had them on my vertical thing. Those ones did better than a lot of the other ones, but I was just doing a pheno hunt, so I wasn't pushing these things or nothing. I was just Let throwing them out for selection. Yeah, I can't really tell yields unless you're doing like what? volume of one variety. You know, that way you can get a quantitative, a quantitative kind of overall average of what you're pulling for per row or per lighter. Well, I figured I'd ask. Mm -hmm. Are there some other maybe breeders that aren't necessarily as mainstream, Brandon, that you could say like, hey, I grew their shit out because they yeah. donated some? Yeah. So I would say that most of the people that have been my favorite um, that are, you know, obviously I make the stuff that I like the most. Um, but SFV Genetics, he absolutely crushed it with his Blueberry McMuffin. That shit is fire, super fire. That's I I, I have a funny that... story about him in a second, but uh, I'll let you keep going. Okay, so yeah, that guy's got um that gear, man. Every time I've hunted through that that variety, which I'm actually growing some right now too, there's there are winners in there, and it it finishes really fast. It's super beautiful. It's just like it's got that Mac Frost, but it's got this super beautiful beautiful pungent sweet blueberry it's like a mentholated sweet blueberry it's great um also who was, breeder? who was the breeder sfv genetics on instagram he, he's then, down here in socal yeah um also there's a guy out here. His name is Mick, and he owns Concentrated Genetics, and he's got some really great stuff. Actually, the uh, Deep Deuce Daryl, which is a GMO cross, uh, that was that was the that's one of the varieties that my boy's running right now. That's hitting two pounds per light off of uh, the the 280 watt LEDs. And that one comes in real high. I think 27 THC, like four, 4.2 percent terps. And most of the work, most of the stuff I've run by him has been really good. My name is Earl. Has some really, really great stuff. Those are a couple people right offhand that um, I think of uh, of stuff that I've run. Actually, Masonic had some really great gear too. I know some people hate on him, but uh, I ran a bunch of his stuff, and it was all really good. So what's the story, Peter? Hold on. I just plugged my uh, camera back in. Let's see. If... Oh, my God. Uh, so he he came, I and I can't remember which event it was. I think it was the one with, like, Josh D. Th this was at the townhouse pre-COVID. Like Josh D. Mojave Richmond. Uh, I think Trevor. No, no. I'm, I think I'm mixing a panel. But anyway, there was a panel, and uh, I I know what happened now because he actually came up to me at the Emerald Cup. But he was like in the back row heckling the conversation. He wasn't heckling. He was just like talking super loud over the conversation on the stage and everyone like everyone was like dude like shut up like <laughs> and he and he wouldn't stop the whole time and uh he came up to me at the emerald cup and he apologized he was like yeah i was super wasted that night and i was like that makes sense <laughs> so putting it out there right but uh I don't know if he came. I don't think he came uh, Tuesday night. I'll, I'll reach out to him and SFV. I would imagine is San Fernando Valley. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's up there in California. Yeah. I, um, but I do. Stuff. I do have a bag of seeds. 
like I have, man, I have a lot of bags of seeds, but I have this bag of seeds right here that has like all the stuff that I really want to pop like as soon as possible. So I have some like Star Dog times Royal Kush, some uh, GMO times Purple Kush, and I've got a bunch of, dude, I've got a bunch of old school genetics in here. I've got some Humboldt Seed Company stuff. I've just got a ton of really great stuff in here. I want to run through all that stuff from Concentrated Genetics. Humboldt Seed Company. I mean, that's if you're super new to this and you just want to buy a, a, a brand of seeds and run with it, that would be one of the best, I think, in my opinion. Hey, don't yeah, really try I've, got a, I've got a blueberry muffin right now that I'm running yeah. that's through purple. That's I remember like when I was like when I say little kid, but I was probably a teenager, you know, and everybody was trying to get those seeds on the East Coast because that was supposedly the holy grail, you know, if you get oh, those weed. seeds. It's funny because back then I couldn't even sell purple weed. Nobody wanted weed if it was purple. <laughs> I feel like it's still that way now, right? I mean, it's hit or miss. Dude. Like, it, oh, it, it, it comes and goes. It depends on how good your hype mark your hype market is, or like it's it got to be a new market. A new Look, market. It's, it's all, they're all about it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I it's it was weird because there was times where it was real popular, time it wasn't, but. I think what will always sell is not necessarily like just straight purple bud, but where you have lots of colors throughout where you get the different color hues and you get the lavenders and darker colors as well. I remember about you guys, but I remember being a kid and we got that purple weed in and we were all excited. <laughs> <laughs> Never went out of fucking trend. It How just never you? packed the punch that that. Oh, it's not here. Are it's you high as hell right now? You have like extra grin today. No, uh, well, I was telling Leighton before we went live that I, like my stress levels pre Tuesday night were like up here, and now they're just like psh, right down here. Um, now I was gonna say this is some coastal Panama red and some uh, weeds should taste good stuff going up to Canada. So nice. So no, um, I'm going to, I got uh, to really, hop off here pretty soon, but do you I'll see that? Out. Oh, oh girl, girl. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go into that and kind of give you guys a, a rundown of some of the cool stuff I have going on out here. And then I, I'm going to hop off. Uh, so Gorilla Glue is a great breeder. All the stuff that I've made with it has been excellent. Um, I get a lot of funk off of it. It brings a lot of resin to the table. <clears throat> Sometimes it can breed a little bit of stretch into stuff, but other than that, uh, I still have it. I still have the original cut, and I'm going to be hitting that with uh, Starfighter Mail along with a bunch of other stuff onto this. I'm going to be using the Starfighter Mail that I have. Yeah, that GG line, that, that's kind of sad how everything just uh, went the way that it did in the passing. So it'd be, it'd be cool to see you continue the work, man. Well, there's still GG strains. Uh, Gray Skull, he's out here in Oklahoma, and he's doing all the breeding for GG strains now. So him and Cat work together, and I, I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but I can always just call him up and see what he's doing. He doesn't do social media very much. You just got to call him one of those types of deals yeah he's always cool um, <laughs> yeah but i've got some stuff going right now so i have i have a uh that high divorce rate which is that that variety that was featured on the uh high times page cross that with my limelight and i haven't even shucked the seeds so that'll drop eventually soon i have another drop coming up the death by lime um, and then I have some stuff that just came down. We did our first black lime reserve <laughs> crosses with the uh, the pheno, the male and phenos that I selected out of all of the seed stock that I ran. And so I have F2 black lime reserve. I have the black lime reserve times starfighter, uh, starfighter pheno number one and starfighter pheno, pheno number two. And then I think uh, a purple punch got hit. 
and something else. Oh yeah, I, and a and one of those blueberry mac muffins. I I like the recycled graphic. Well, that's see, so for <laughs> that line, the same mail was used to make to make both right. of those lines, the black light and the limelight. And so you'll also see those same characters in a lot of my packaging because I use a lot of the same. I'm using you know all the lime stuff that I have. You know, I'll do a cross of this, maybe this with this. And so you'll see the same characters with the stickers and the t-shirts and all that. But uh, Yeah, Monkey, I reached out to Ace, uh, I think, last week. I've been trying to get in touch with them for a while. So um, I'm going to be going, but before I go, what I got is I got some really cool stuff going to be happening out here. Um, I'm moving to a different part of the state. It's a little more scenic. It's kind of like the Northern California of the state. It's hills and lakes and streams. It's really beautiful. But I am working on a business contract to build a zero emissions green fertilizer plant that also will have the ability to do green waste recycling at the same place. And then build, we're going to build that out and then build a farm around it. So we're going to use the fertilizer to help bioremediate the soil. And then we're going to use, you know, different ag practices to do the remediation processes, do monocrop agriculture. And then we're going to be recycling all of the waste that come, that's produced from that farm to put back into that system to, to close those loops. And then any excess that we have, uh, we can also use as a product, you know, for to dis distribute to local people, other farmers. And then we'll use all the produce that we uh, produce uh, and we'll have that integrated into local um, markets to try to create these like kind of closed loop ag system. So are you doing this in the western part of the state? Southeast. South, southeast. Yeah, southeast. Oh, so isn't that like the Arzokes or? Ozark. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's in that Missouri. Yeah, that's no, Missouri. It, it is on the. It's on the. It's like 15 minutes from Arkansas, 15 minutes from Texas, so it's the lower right-hand corner of Oklahoma. So yeah, you got to be in the hills there. That's, yeah, that's a beautiful right. part of the world. Yeah, it's nice out there. So working on that, I'm going to be moving out and also setting up vertically integrated. Uh, garden with processing and all that stuff out there and moving yeah so it's exciting lots of different things going on i appreciate you guys having me on for everybody who doesn't know me you can find me at instagram at that same uh same logo on the screen rust.brandon and you can find a link to my company bokashi earthworks where i specialize in carbon-based fertilizer microbes and organic amendments Soon I'll have my nutrient calculator, which will be pretty cool. Once that's up and running, you can just put in the numbers that you get from the lab and it'll shoot out you a printout of what you need to add to the system. Nice. Nice. Well, we uh, appreciate you coming on as a surprise guest, man. And uh, I know that <laughs> more and more people will uh, uh, take to heart this kind of stuff because uh, this is the forward thinking uh at the commercial level for sure it, it lasted longer than mr toad's cameo where he came into the wrong conversation <laughs> <laughs> he's two for two though he's there yesterday and today right. so he's still getting screen time <laughs> it, it was uh all right see you brandon bye um, Thanks, brandon. Th there was a guy so tuesday night we had this outdoor space and they're kind of like huh? walls it's like in LA, a lot of restaurants in COVID took over the street parking and kind of made like outdoor areas down on the street. And that's kind of what the townhouse did. And uh, they're like, you know, walls around it, but like, you know, it goes up to probably here. So I'm filming 
Tyler from Family Tree and um, Eric from Organics Alive, like they were both sharing their weed and we were rolling joints and talking about what each of them was growing. <clears throat> and there was like this head that kept popping up over the uh, over the fence, like behind them. And I'm looking through the camera and I keep, it's probably like this 20 year old kid and he's smoking weed out of like a, a, like a, a soda can that's been like crushed in. And, uh, he, he can smell all our, like he can smell, like there's like weed being smoked everywhere in here. And this dude like keeps like poking his head over and I was the only one who noticed him and, and I was cracking up and I was so high and I was like trying to like, our, I was trying to get their attention to be like, smoke that guy out so i finally like managed to be like give that guy a nug of something and uh but it, it was like it was for like 40 minutes this guy kept like popping up and like pop like popping back down like a, a meerkat and uh and the only other person who noticed him was a uh, masonic smoker was there and and he he actually filmed it and i was like with all the people, like, I was like, did everybody notice him or like, just, he was like, no, I don't think anyone else noticed that dude, but he just kept popping up and popping down, popping up, popping down. So anyway. And this was Tuesday? Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why didn't he come in? I, I don't know if he thought it was like some private party. I mean, we, we gave him stuff and, uh. I don't know if he was like a homeless street kid or uh, which would be my best guess, but uh, he, he, he did get some of Tyler's weed. So. And then smoked it out of a soda yeah. can. Yeah. That's rough. <laughs> that is a rough. We, we did not have any extra pipes to donate to his cause. Um, but I actually Tuesday, uh, yesterday, no, sorry, Wednesday, I was at Gemma's soccer practice. And on the way there, I reached down for my pipe in the car and it was like packed with whatever the last thing I had smoked the night before was. So, which I think was, I think that was from Eric, but I have no idea what it was, but, uh, it was very nice. Even the next day. Well, there you go. I mean, if there's a bunch of people sitting around smoking good weed, I would imagine more people would be popping over the fence. <laughs> That's what I was waiting because it's such a street. It's such like a street trap, like a foot traffic street. You know, people like literally the the beach is, you know, like 200 yards that way. Um, so it'll be interesting if we keep doing these, just all the random people who walk by and are like. Because people had their dab rigs out, there were torches. Uh, yeah, yeah. The beach life—that's where it's at. Yeah, yeah it that's that, that's why I joke. When I like did an Instagram post, and I was like, I'd like to thank all the people who braved the seventy-degree LA weather and all the dank weed, two hundred yards from the ocean to to watch a two-hour reggae show. Life's rough, huh? Yes. It's the how's, LA it temp, life. how's the temp out there brian uh it's not bad today but it's supposed to snow uh this weekend so that's kind of colorado life it'll be like 60 and then negative four and you're like oh shit so it bounces late, back and forth did we did we hit all of the key nutrient cycling system topics you wanted to hit on or or did we leave any out uh, you know, I would say that we left a shit ton out, but we covered a shit ton that I didn't expect to. So For I would sure. say it was a it was a wonderful trade off. Um, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to uh, Brandon. I, you know, he's got an amazing head, and um, the direction he took it in has has always amazed me. And yeah, I did scope the soil a while back, and it was it was some beautiful stuff. And um, I just remember asking him, like, well, you know, why do you continuously add these microbes to it? But now I get it. I, I understand his system. And he's relying on the endophytic uh, biology that lives in the leaf tissue to come out naturally over the course of time, um, which is great. I mean, on a commercial grow, he, you can do that. I mean, he's he's had the 
the fortitude or wherewithal to, you know, jumpstart a system and then let it turn it loose and let it really run. But, you know, that's, again, like understanding that feeding biology, biology is a great way to increase nutrient cycling with a, you know, very little concern about throwing anything out of balance. You, you can't. Um, so that's a great uh, twist on it. And, you know, I love the fact that he dragged carbon into it. <laughs> It's another fucking rabbit hole for another time. But, you know, again, it's like understanding that these things that are happening, like he says, real time that are so complex because, you know, this electron gets pulled off here. A bacteria breaks down this carbon chain, snaps one of the legs off, uh, pulls one of the compounds. And then all of a sudden they mix up and turn into something else. And that's that's kind of. The direction I really wanted to, you know, bang home to people is that this is really a super complex thing, um, but it can be simplified down into, you know, those things, the, the basic three, um, your, your soil, the physical component, chemistry and biology. And if you have those three things in play, um, then the magic really starts to happen. And over time, it just gets better and better and, and turns into water only. So. I mean, we could we could go on and on and on, uh, but I think that the the real message, the the take home is that you know there are many ways to skin the cat, but although it never likes it, um, but you can you can nutrient cycle you know through fertility or through biology or a combination of both. And if there were any questions out there, go ahead and ask them now. Um, I'm more than happy to you know touch on them. Well, here's here's one that might offend some people is. Uh, when you, when you're, you know, you're getting older, you've studied this, your, you know, you, most of your adult life or your adult life. Um, do you see it as everything has evolved to this point with how complex this stuff is and how little we know about it? Or do you still see without putting like dogma into it? Do you see this more as like, it's a design thing where it seems like, it, so, you know, the spark is placed and then all these little machines know exactly what to do. And then as things continue to improve, there's more carbon. They know. All right. Now let's be more aggressive. Uh, do you what are your thoughts on that? All right. Let me try to wrap my head around what you're trying to say. Um, maybe rephrase it a little bit. So the more that I understand about the soil food web and just the way that it seems like if, if everybody involved is getting, you know, they're, they're giving and someone else is taking. So it's back and forth. That creates that symbiotic relationship at that level that it's so small that for the most part, anything that's non-beneficial really can't take hold. Um, so there's it seems like there's an aspect of design as well as, you know, evolve evolution to it. But I, but. Most people that would agree with the evolution side would never say that it, they see any design aspect to it. And I, I'm assuming you're saying design uh, like by an, an outer influence, a universal energy right. source. What, right. And I don't want to bring in just just the fact that it something, some, whatever, that there's some kind of design aspect to it is all I was trying to dip my toe in because I know that people... People feel certain ways about a variety of things, but the more that you understand about how these things kind of operate, it it does seem like symbiotic stuff just thrives. And so if, you, if, if you're feeding my family and I'm feeding your family, well, hey, we got a lot more opportunity to go out more carbon in our pockets. Everybody out there is seem like they're going out hunting for the day and bringing back more more money for, you know, everybody else. And it seems like as that starts to build up, you get that utopia back to kind of tie this together. You start to understand more about how important the trace minerals are for cannabis farming. And then that's where you're able to take yourself to the elite level like Brandon has shown. When you really start to understand the planet at the level that Brandon does and a lot of other high end cannabis farmers, high end carbon farmers, uh, you know, it really does come back to really just kind of keeping things as basic as possible and allowing Mother Nature as best you can to kind of rein in that system to your environment. And now you're going to be extremely successful because he also understands breeding and can, he's well connected, obviously. Well, I think you touched on a bunch of shit there. I mean, um, soil food web, I think the foundation of the soil food web is um, is to outcompete. So um, by putting an abundance of um, diversity 
into your soil system, you're preventing one one aspect from running away or uh, getting out of control. Kind of like we go back and talk about the virus. So there's, you know, we don't even know hundreds of thousands, maybe billions, you know, maybe as little as a few thousand viruses in each in every living cell. And those viruses turn on and off um, based on uh, inappropriate behavior. And if that, if this this group of bacteria is running amok and running out of control and not allowing the balance that you're talking about to occur, then they turn on and, and they start taking out um, that particular strain of bacteria. So there are regulators, or I, I love to call them great correctors, um, present at a you know viral bacterial level. Uh, let's zoom out and go into communities of biology. Um, that that is the key to i would say balance um so again if you don't have proper balance things gets out of control and i think he said that balance was you know the word balance i don't know how many fucking times when he was talking and i think it's the key to the whole thing and, and again you know uh soil food web preaches balance in both f to b which is still you know I think Brandon was on to something there. And it's like, well, if you're counting just saprophytic fungi, you're missing mycorrhizae, you're missing yeast, you're missing molds, you're missing trichoderma, all of these other components of the fungal kingdom. And so, again, if you have all of those pieces in play, and supposedly if they're one-to-one -one balance, then you're going to have a, a really good um, potential for a healthy soil that will continue to evolve and hit that utopia that you're talking about. Um, but if you're starting out and you're missing something, especially in a controlled environment, um, and you're expecting that to come in somehow, that's where I think it gets a little dicey. I mean, in a controlled environment, yes, you're still gonna get microbes in on the air, um, perhaps on your skin or your clothes, but it's not going to be at the level that you need to uh, create that balance. So, you know, again, I think that especially for the new guy starting out and trying to set up a, a living ecosystem, which is really what you're trying to do. You're, you're, you're trying to give this plant the, the best potential home or environment um, to produce its greatest self. And so there's where you really need to add components like, you know, these inoculants, whether it's uh, the ones that he's producing as, a, as an EM or the ones like fish brew, which is an aquatic, uh, aquatic microorganisms um, or the stuff that I do, which I'm taking worm castings, fish brew and biological compost and trying to give you a shotgun that, that, that's going to provide that balance out of the gate so that you are, again, setting yourself up to prevent an outrun or an outbreak or out of control uh, group of microbes that could potentially create problems or, or encourage pathogenic outbreaks, which is <laughs> your worst fucking nightmare in an indoor grow. Um, you know, you get, you get a, a fungal outbreak or a, a pathogenic um, bacteria uh, that can cause, you know, damage to the plant. You're fucked because now you really got to reset. Um, it's not like you can just go in there and, and, and you know, spray it down with bleach. <laughs> so then here again, now you've got to pound it with more um, diverse biology to try to push that back into balance. But it's a lot of energy and a lot of work. So um, I think that's, you know, that's the soil food web camps approach is, is diversity, uh, diversity, diversity. Um, I think that, you know, Brandon's approach is more, um, I'm, I'm in a position to understand what I'm doing based on these tests that I do every two weeks. And I don't think that the little guys can afford to do that. Um, all of that testing, it's not outrageously expensive, but it's not cheap either. And, you know, if you're, if, if he wasn't doing that stuff, then he would never be able to achieve the levels that he is uh, because he's constantly steering. He's constantly adding a little this, adding a little that. Oh, this is showing deficiency. And his understanding of the relationships of, and this is one I really wanted to touch on with him, is calcium to nitrogen. 
there's some crazy shit going on there. Um, now, I understand the relationship of iron and making it available and how critical it is. Um, so anyway, here, here, here nor there, there are all of these interactions within, inter within the actions or reactions that are occurring um, constantly that makes it a lot more complex. But if the one takeaway you get from uh, this podcast today is that um, understanding that you can cycle um, hundreds of pounds per acre over 60 day period, just using biology. And that's not adding any, any minerals. That's allowing the biology to pull from the sandstone clay and release that nitrogen and the organic nitrogen that's tied up. There's an amazing study that I read, God, probably three years ago about the fact that we don't need any nitrogen in our soil. That's not pushing the plant though. Again, Brandon's trying to push this plant to just perform, hit its hit its genetic potential, and produce copious amounts of flour, which which is you know that's pushing a plant. That's that's racing. Um, so if you're racing, then yeah, you've got to be doing those things. But if you're a new guy and you're just trying to get your foot in the door and get and get your you know feet wet, whatever you want to call it, then the the best approach possible is to Again, start with testing, understand what you brought in, whether it's you built the horizontal system or whether you bought super soil that's front loaded. You know, knowing that is a very important piece and then testing after the run to see what you have removed from the system. And again, putting all that plant matter that you're not using back into that soil system, really important. And for, for you guys that make hash, you're crazy to throw that plant matter out. That should all either be composted or just top dressed back in. And along with your wash water, a wash water is incredibly valuable as a fertilizer. Um, Why do you think like when you do get to start to reusing that soil system, the fan leaves start to get these kind of rails with the trichomes. Uh, then when you're uh, chopping and dropping with the fan leaves that do have the trichomes, it does seem like everything just kind of takes off more. So having that base and then adding the little cakes and cookies, as Dr. Elaine Ingham says, is that also how you're then able to get more trace minerals and all that as things are mined? Well, think about what you just said, right? So when you put that fan leaf that has the trichomes back in there, it just seems to get things going. The same exact thing is true when you take wash water for making hash. Brandon said it spot on. Water is the ultimate solvent. So all of that stuff gets suspended and therefore released back. So, you know, those trace minerals that it took to build that trichome that you just threw back into the soil system is now back in the soil system. So you've, you've, you've helped to maintain a certain level. Now, remember, all the flour that you took out um, required a tremendous amount of trace minerals. And... I think they are they are probably the most overlook overlooking and misunderstood critical component to uh, plant physiology and, and plant health. Um, if you don't have enough molybdenum, your plant's not going to be able to function uh, to provide certain um, functions for its growth or its flower production uh, or its cell elongation or perhaps a defense. So you're missing, um, you're, you're restricting, you're, you're potentially not allowing that genetic potential to be expressed. So, you know, that's whenever I do a soil test for somebody, first thing I do is look at the chemistry. What's your pH? What's your organic matter? Um, next, I'll bounce to um, texture and I'll be like, okay, what's your clay sand silt relationship? Then I look at CEC and CEC, I go, okay, CEC is high or CEC is low. Then I look back at the relationship of clay and organic matter because that CEC is coming from one of those two sources. And that's telling me the potential, if it's a real high CEC and then the saturated paste test is way off, then I know that soil has great potential, but now I got to get the, the, the sites back in balance. And that was something else Brandon was talking about was like when he, when he flips to flower, he, he cuts calcium back by 25%. That plant is still pulling a lot of calcium out of there. But what he's doing is as that calcium is pulled off those CEC exchange sites, 
you're shifting your calcium to potassium ratio back in line with allowing more potassium to be present for that plant to push the or, or mine or, or chelate the phosphorus for the plant flowering. So again, these, you know, shit gets fucking complicated really quick. And I think that as long as you understand that, yeah, everything that you pulled out of that soil, that that plant brought to the surface, if all of that goes back in, that plant's going to go crazy next year because you didn't remove anything from the soil system. But the goal of growing that plant is not to put it all back in the soil system. You know, that's, that's nature's way of building incredible fertility over a period of time. She ain't taking nothing away. And the animals that come and eat the fruits off of the, or, or the bark or whatever, they're excreting right in that spot. So again, it's the minerals and the nutrients and the trace minerals. And the, you know, we can get into all those biogeochemical processes, but it's all staying present or, or for the most part, the vast majority of it is putting it back into play. So again, if you're, if you're removing, say a pound of material out of there and you have no idea what made up that pound, as far as the chemistry is concerned, then you're, you're flying blind. You know, you're, you're, you, you can't properly make an intelligent decision about what do I need to put back into play to make sure that next run I'm getting the same kind of results with, with the yields that I'm desiring. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I I like too how he was taking us to the next next level where I, now I feel like it's common knowledge, but that calcium really needs to be at the forefront of a beginning farmer's um, thought process. And for a long time, it was more like, you know, getting back to the, the nitrogen. And, um, you know, I think you were even referring still to Dr. Lane Ingham, where she talks about there's enough I don't know if she talks about all the all the uh, elements, but there's enough nitrogen in the soil. Uh, all you need to do is farm it, mine it. And do you feel that way or do you feel like with cannabis, uh, even if you do have a well-built soil system, you're going to always kind of have to add to, to keep everything built? Well, again, there's a difference between a soil system and, and a agricultural system. So... Rust or Brandon's running a friggin' ag system. Like he's he's pushing these plants, he's mining materials. Um, so yeah, he's got to add back. Whereas in nature, if you just took that seed and and plucked it in the ground and and made sure that it maintained a proper moisture by watering it periodically, um, you're not pushing the plant. You're not you're not you're not racing the the plant you know by forcing it to pull up all of these minerals and and um you know nutrients so it, it's different animal it's it's like uh yin and yang it's one is one and one is the other and and yes they interweave and they're definitely interconnected but you know i think that's the big difference is like if you're just a you know tent grower and you're not you're not worried about trying to yield as much as you possibly can or push that genetic to the end result or to, to its fullest potential, then it's less of a concern um, out of the gate. But you do hit on a very good point that calcium really should be a macronutrient. Um, it, it is critical. I mean, it's again, calcium's ability to be used as an exudate is unique and special uh, unlike a lot of other elements out there. So if the plant has excess calcium stored into its system, um, it can then take those calcium <coughs> ions <clears throat> and push them out as exudates and knock potassium or knock sodium off of those exchange sites and make room for more calcium. So basically you can store it's calcium in the plant or it can store it in the root matrix or in the, in the soil matrix where it can be retrieved again when it needs. So by front loading calcium in the beginning of the plant is extremely wise. Um, again, a beginner grower, do they need to do that? No, because you're, you're probably going to put too much on. And again, anything totally out of whack is going to be a huge problem. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying be a moron. I'm just saying be really careful. But yes, you can add more calcium on the front side, understanding that the plant can take it up and use it as, as a 
bank account either in the soil or in its tissue so exactly uh, and, I, and that was the missing piece i feel like for a long time is that nobody really talked about that or focused on that so how would we even be able to understand the full potential of the the cannabis plant uh when we're missing all of those trace elements we don't you know we're cow mag is kind of almost you know it's been almost kind of silly with uh, like snl skits and stuff i mean yeah, yeah it was important but it wasn't explained on a whole nother level when you're talking about with microbes and with exudates and it seems it seems like as a farmer you are leveling up your skill set once you've had a six a few successful flips and now your focus is on calcium now your focus is on uh farming for trace minerals uh, that's when, again, you're going to continue to, you know, climb the ladder of of becoming a successful farmer. And there's, you know, one way of obviously doing it. And the other way is kind of biohacking uh, Mother Nature and understanding that there are almost there are laws and rules of certain things. And as long as you manage that system, uh, she, she will kind of protect and, and and bring that love back to you as long as you're in the garden every single day. We were kind of talking about that yesterday where there's there are farmers out there that that want to you know be in there maybe once once a week twice a week kind of thing and that's just a whole different level of farming whole different mindset of farming uh, but it I agree with that when you're when you're in the uh, in the in the grow every day uh, there's just something to the the symbiotic relationship that you have with your plants I, I just there's just something extra when you're actually in there every day taking care of them, cutting them, looking after them uh, as to where it's just a commodity who gives a fuck. Well, yeah, there's an energy transfer. Remember, you're living and that plant is living. And in many ways, that plant is uh, unique and special um, on many, many levels, not just because it gets us high. Um, it has incredible ability to um, mine nutrient uh it's a dynamic accumulator. So it can mine stuff that, that other plants can't. Uh, that's why originally they called it weed because it would grow fucking anywhere. Right. So that's, that's unusual for, for plants. I mean, you can't take a cactus and throw it in a rainforest. It ain't going to make it. You can throw a cannabis plant there. Um, you can take a, a, a cannabis plant and throw it in the desert, but that doesn't mean you can grow a redwood in the desert or, or a, you know, a, a fucking rubber tree plant. So in that regard, cannabis is a very, very special plant. But again, there's, there's the two thoughts. I mean, are you pushing? And if you're pushing, then you need those trace minerals. You need to have, you need to provide the access to all of the things that that plant could potentially need or want to be its best self. And again, at the end of the day, all it wants to do is make you happy, right? It's like, I think that humans, biggest problem we have here is this disconnect. You know, we're disconnected from the plants. We're disconnected from the animals. We're disconnected from the fucking soil that allowed everything to happen. And so when you're disconnected then you don't understand these you know intricacies that that are occurring which is why we're having this fucking conversation today is that you know if you were if you were not disconnected you wouldn't need any of this you wouldn't you wouldn't need to be hearing you know about um these bio geochemical reactions that are happening uh, at a scale that's that's probably not even comprehensible, um, and how one's getting pulled here, another one's <laughs> getting pulled there. Cheddar me, 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 no, no, he's not. I, I, I'm I'm tripping myself out. So this this is on channel two, and uh, do you think Cheddar Bob's thinking about such deep things right now? He's he's happily making his rosin. <laughs> he doesn't need it. <laughs> and he doesn't people. know he's on right now. No, he. They, they're having a whole conversation on. It's just a bunch of. Uh, it's like him, Toad, I think, Potent Ponix, oh. uh, and a couple other people. But uh, I thought I'd cut to the money shot. I, I, he was actually pressing it earlier, but you, Layton, was making an important point. I didn't want to mess up the point. But uh, all right, back to our regularly scheduled programming. And, but we have an add-on. What's up, Smiley? Hey, what's going on, man? This How is you the doing? show of surprises. Uh, yeah. What's up, brother? What's going on, man? 
it's been a good uh, good conversation dude yeah um i don't know brandon was awesome he's always cool to listen to but I don't know. I always keep I always keep hearing these conversations, and I still come back to though like there's there's got to be the proper structure in the soil media to have the ability to house the proper biology too. So like it kind of comes back to that having the you know proper way to have moisture flow through that soil and and have proper aggregate structure for the biology to hold on to and live in. You know. I think I think you nailed it. it. It's in order for the bio geo chemical reactions to occur, you need to have the proper environment or or suitable structure for that to happen. And he touched on that for sure. But and again, he can run he can run a low tension um, super soil because again, he's pounding it with with biology every once a month and chemistry. Um, once a month. I think he said every other week he feeds and then every other week he adds biology. I don't know if that means he does it twice or skips, trades the biology for the chemistry. But again, that's possible to do in that system. But it, for a, a little guy, a tent grower or someone that's, you know, that's trying to run something that is less labor intensive, then you got to go back to sand, silk, clay and organic matter and provide the ability for those aggregates to happen because aggregation is never going to happen in a, in a low tension soil. It's just not fucking possible. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to eventually that the, the substrate's going to break down, but you're going to have silt. You're not going to have clay. You're not going to have sand. You're not going to have those other nutrient pools that the biology can pull from for thousands of fucking years. You know, how long is it going to take a sand particle to break down a long fucking time? So, Again, they're the apples to oranges. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's the real thing that people should understand that, yeah, he can accomplish what he can. He, he is showing us that he can accomplish um, incredible production because he's using these things that don't require uh, geochemical reactions to occur in aggregation <laughs> and to provide that nutrient. So I think that's that was one of the big takeaways. And, and again, he understands all these processes, but he also relies on instruments and um, testing to to keep everything in sync. And Smiley, come on, man, jump in on some of this shit. I know you. I can't wait. Chop, I was chop. just gonna say, like, I, you can't argue with the plant health that Brandon's getting either. Like that. I don't know if you could follow him on Instagram, but that uh, double onion burger or whatever he's got going. I think it's one of his crosses he's testing. That whole round is looks unbelievably amazing, you know. It's just so yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily always listen to Brandon and think like think in the same line of thinking as he is, but yeah, it's like it's hard to argue, man. He's definitely uh, on point with shit. So. Is, is that's that why I'm glad on this show we can talk about both styles. Where one camp is going to be like, ah, uh, that's you know, we should have a, a different dialogue on a lot of this stuff, man, and. Um, <laughs> It's cool to see. And then there's also on the flip side, you know, the, the people we talked about uh, when you were on the show, Smiley, you know, there's there's camps out there that are doing it on a different in a different way with just as much success. So the end goal, obviously, is plant health. So I think it would be a lot harder if you're a newer farmer to farm the way that Brandon is uh, comfortably because he just has the knowledge base to be able to manage if do if things went wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's that you're driving a fucking Ferrari. Yeah, it'd be difficult to do it because you'd have to be taking the same measurements he is, just like what Leighton was saying. I mean, it'd be like flying a plane without knowing how to read all the all the instruments, you know. <laughs> not not a, not a particularly safe place to be. <laughs> Smiley, you got anything you want to add about the nutrient cycling and in your experiences? Well, I, I guess I was just going to say, like, from my experience with going, you know, like in a, my system's too small, like, and that's the real consideration is like, what, what size media are you using? Like, so there's a lot of different things can happen and in, in ground outside versus like in a bed versus like in a number 15 pot, you know what I mean? So a lot of those are going to be a different consideration, but the biggest eye opening thing for me with like doing the soil testing was, 
just the the little micronutrients that it was lacking that I would have never keyed up on. You know what I mean? I would have never had a visual cue on some of those things until they were way out of whack. Like that manganese, um, the uh, uh, copper and uh, iron were like three of them that were kind of, you know, now that I've seen it, iron kind of does show because it's, it, it's in the formation of that chlorophyll. So it'll kind of show its face a little bit, almost like a magnesium type thing, you know. And with that stuff, it's really like a Goldilocks approach. I mean, you don't want you don't want to just be going and adding a bunch of trace minerals. That's not what we're saying. You know, you get, you want to use Mother Nature to decide that for you. Um, and I think that's where you'll see success in really doing your pheno hunts. Yeah, and then it, it does, Chad's in, in chat here saying, you know, like it does come back to that question of like what is a healthy plant? You know what I mean? Like our, our, I mean, we always kind of get visual cues on stuff and then, you know, leaves are praying, it's green. It's, well, how green is it? You know what I mean? And is the stem green? Are the, are the petioles all green? Like, you know, I mean, there's just all these little different subtle things. Like, you know, is the, in the leaf, is the vein of the leaf the same color as the rest of the leaf or is it a different color you know what i mean and those can be telltale signs of different things too so it's i like yeah. stalk structure as well you know how they say like popcorn muscles i've seen that where the genetics are kind of weak but from you know 20 feet away they look pretty strong and healthy and again so. you just hit the nail on the head what is the genetics because genetic expression can be radically different you may think it's a deficiency or an unhealthy, uh, an illness, whatever, but it's really just the genetic expression of that particular cultivar. That's where cannabis gets fucking crazy. And and then on top of that, how easily uh, it, it breeds and crosses. And, you know, so every time you're going back and, and even, even within the same uh, cultivar, a highly stable genetic is still going to have different expressions. Um, so, you know, Chad, to, to what's a healthy plant? Well, where's the soil end and the plant start? It's the same fucking thing. You're, there's no way to ever say, well, this plant is, is super healthy. Um, and that one isn't the, and, and because of just an expression, it could be an operator error or lack of a trace mineral. I mean, there's just so many complex factors that, that go into, uh, a healthy plant or a healthy soil system and and reality is what is health well health may be something to you brian that's different for me and it's different for smiley so you know those are those are some pretty fucking deep questions kind of like oh well, let's go down the hat route hole of fo folding proteins and having different interactions on a cellular level inside the cell i mean it's just it's pixelated man it goes so deep and so big Layton, this is the question Smiley always asks me. I've never been able to satisfy his answer. Who's this? Ch Ch <laughs> uh, dude, I I'm fucking telling you, man. It, it's it, I, I think that it goes into levels of, of complexity that we are just starting to fucking scratch the surface on. And, and you know, maybe a hundred years from now at the at the pace of of understanding or uh, testing or tools that were now coming available, whether it's crunching data points or whatever, that we may start to get some answers. Um, but again, you know, the deeper you go down this rabbit hole, the, the more fucking complex and in flux everything is. <clears throat> Being in flux in itself is a, is an issue because everything you every data point you're looking at is just a fucking snapshot. It's a nanosecond in time. And so, <laughs> Layton, let me ask you this. What do you think of the plant? Have you ever heard of John Kemp's plant health pyramid and that the levels of kind of how he he monitors or how he would score health in a plant? Um, I have. I'm a big fan of John Kemp. I did see uh, something on that. But, you know, I, I process so much information. I got to I got to dump data just to take in new data. So. Peter, maybe pull up that plant health pyramid if you can, if you're listening, because that might be a great place to, to have a conversation about. All right, give me a second. Yeah, because he kind of separates it in like, 
like the first level is the plant's ability to even photosynthesize. And then like the second level is its ability to, to process nitrogen. And, and like the third level is its ability to, uh, to bring in more complex proteins. And look at this, and look at this pair of uh, Cause this was, this was where I was going today was both the sand silk clay pyramid as well as the nutritional food pyramid. Look at the bottom of that pyramid. What does it say? Mineral water, 50%. So 50% of your fucking health as a human being is based on mineral water. Does anybody have fucking mineral water anymore? Yes, sir. El Dorado delivered to the house. <laughs> But that's why that's so important, because I do think that some people that drink RO water, or distilled water, and don't understand that, that they're causing damage to their system drinking that much. Uh, well, like they're, actually, water. They're, they're pulling nutrients because of the water stripping them. But uh, on the right, we look at vegetables, we look at grains, we look at meat. And do you see anywhere in this that it talks about vitamins and minerals other than the water? Right. So so you're basing nutrition on something that has radically fucking changed over the course of my life. So from the time I was born, the apples I ate, the carrots I ate to now have, I believe the, the numbers were staggering, like somewhere between 25 and 50 percent less nutritional value. All right. I'm glad we now we're back on to this. Uh, so its ability to photosynthesize is the foundation of plant health. Well, that makes sense because the more the plant can photosynthesize, the more energy it can create, um, the more abundance it can create. So I, that makes a lot of sense that it's, you know, it's the foundation. Um, protein synthesis. Oh, God, I was just talking about folding proteins. That's a whole nother fucking topic that's like, super complicated and super deep but if if the plants can fold the protein absorb them first and then fold them to do other processes whether it's uh, uh change their ph adjust uh, the the um the cytoplasm for uh, division or whatever um yeah those those are really really important intercellular um components increased lipid synthesis okay fats it's all about fat and increased plant secondary metabolites so that's your fruit that's your cannabinoids that's your your terpenes so yeah i think that's a pretty good representation of of the important aspects of what would be considered a whether it's a healthy plant or a functional plant because you can have a super healthy plant that doesn't produce a lot of fruit um because of uh, an imbalance in the soil or the microbiota. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about what this plant's growing in because that can hinder some of those things. Um, well, I wanted to ask Smiley a question with, with the pyramid that you're showing everybody. Do you, do you personally believe the bottom part, the quote from John? I can't read it from my perspective. It says healthy here. plants can ultimately be completely resistant to di diseases and insects. <laughs> oh man, that's a that's a deep conversation. I guess I've never the completely part. Seen it. I guess is the main. Yeah, I've never personally seen it. I mean, John definitely has a ton of years of experience and uh, and talks about some of the trials and things he's done. So. I mean, some of those are interesting. What what is maybe been the driving factor of it? I don't know. You know, what I mean, so like, I know that's a highly dis highly debated thing. Um, but no, I I don't personally try to you know rely on that and be like you know I guess boast like oh my plants are level five, so I'm never gonna get whatever you know. So it, it's not. I don't know. I don't think that way, but I, I, what I really gained from the plant health pyramid is the whole thought process of how, how the plant is trying to process the nutrients that you're giving it and then it's taking in and, and then how ways you can kind of visually maybe see that happening in the plant. You know what I'm saying? So like, you know, it still comes back to that visual stuff. I don't know of any way to measure these things 
without doing like plant sap like john talks about a lot but but you know it's just the whole concept or the idea of it is that it's kind of plant health is centered around how well and functioning the soil biology is happening so on those higher levels like like john says often like you know four and five are the two levels that you're never going to achieve you know without having some kind of biology involved in it so i think part of that is also on at least on that side of the camp you you achieve 12 percent bricks oh you're probably getting exactly what I, you achieve 12 percent bricks or, or higher and supposedly that was I think that even came from like Harley Smith days and stuff. Uh, but, you know, some camps believe that some camps don't. But it does seem like the higher the bricks levels, the overall health of the entire garden. So maybe not necessarily per plant, but just the overall uh, health of the entire system. When you're focused on calcium, which I, I have personally seen when you focus on calcium, focus on trace minerals, uh, bricks levels go up. Again, you're giving the plant the ability to function on all its cylinders. So it only makes sense. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of a, a bold statement that it, it will eliminate disease. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's viruses within that plant that could potentially come out because of a misappropriated genetic expression that would say, you know, even though you had it in the perfect conditions, the plant still dudded or it did something funky like had weird leaf structures or so i think it's dangerous to say i i think it's dangerous for what he said i get what he meant he, he means that you significantly reduce the potential for for bad things to happen um but it's not to say i mean look at look at invasive insects right they show up and they fucking take shit down so uh a, perhaps a new bug rolls into town and your plant is super healthy, um, but it likes it. It's the perfect plant health isn't going to protect it from an invasive species that's moved into the territory. And again, think of, again, there's no such thing as ev evasive. It's evolution for Christ's sake. Um, there's everything is always evolving and, and moving. Um, so, I think it's a bold statement. I think it, it's probably uh, should be rewarded a little bit. Yeah, nature does always goes the least path of resistance, but it also functions like nature's not pretty, man. She can be pretty fucking ugly. When you well, really like so Layton, back to that, though, it kind of goes back to the idea of like, you know, if you're going to foliar spray, you should foliar spray for plant health versus trying to like go in for war, you know, and that's kind of one of the statements i know some of the guys have made that you know like i spray for health instead of war and that's that's kind of along that idea of what kemp's talking about is like if if you can you know increase what's going on inside that plant that it gives it better ability to defend itself from whatever pathogen you know and that that idea i think stands pretty solid you know what i'm saying but the way you just said that that's gospel i think okay. a lot of people would agree with that but it, yeah. it's not a foolproof plan it's right. just something that you're always trying to achieve and i don't think anybody would ever fully achieve that with how quickly cannabis is flipped there's always in and out something and there's just potential for risk i think that's also why a lot more how do you feel about this smiley when larger facilities won't let um most of their employees farm are there are more people are starting to you know management is starting to switch to that manner where if you work here you're not you're not going to be able to manage your own tent grow or, or basement grow. I understand it because it's definitely a, an added risk for them to have, you know what I'm saying, extra whatever pathogen from your garden grow or whatever. I'm not a fan of being told you can't do something, though. So I'm not sad. I'm not really, you know, so. It also, to me, I always kind of saw it as, well, I guess you have no plans to promote from within. You know, you're not going to. I mean, I get both sides of it for sure. But I think if you're setting up your own protocols at, at your farm and maybe just have somebody be like, hey, I'd like to do this. And you, I don't know, maybe mentor them a little bit or something like that. But to not have certain individuals on your team continuing to improve, I think that's a mistake in the long run. Granted, though, you are faced with with more 
you know, you open yourself up to more risk. Yeah, but, you know, like on the other side of things, too, like, you know, how I don't know how that would work for like pheno hunting or different different kind of project stuff. So there could be benefit to them. You know, if you got five of your employees all kind of working on a pheno hunt, you can cover some ground that way, too. You know, what I mean, come up with a killer ass cultivar that you're going to bring in and run, you know. In Denver, I bet 90 percent the the commercial, they don't pheno hunt whatsoever. It's the small time or uh, your, your, you know, home grower. So that's why, you know, I love doing the show with Layton and I'm glad you're coming on and all these other individuals are coming on because once there's a collective voice where it's like, hey, how are you achieving these things? Hey, calcium, you know, and you don't have to just read it on a forum. You can go and check out Brandon's work, check out a variety of other farmers work. Wow, there's something to calcium. You know, that was the secret sauce, I feel like, for a long time. Uh, and a lot of people didn't share that. Uh, from what I understand, also, that's how they were able to improve powdery mildew uh, when the Dutch uh, like hoop houses and stuff, they had huge problems with that. And so they focused on on calcium and supposedly that was helping because the powdery mildew wasn't able to take hold as well. I have no idea if that's true or not. It just seemed like there was a, a, a good community that was voicing their opinion. And then for whatever reason, that went away. Um, and then COVID seemed to kind of bring that back. Well, again, I think that, you know, whether this conversation is about bricks, I think that we're missing a lot of information to make the statement, oh, increased bricks, bricks means less pest production or uh, more pest resistant, I should say. I think that there's some broad strokes being painted there, but I think that we'll find as time goes on that there were some underlying other things that were occurring related to the bricks increase that 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 potentially prevented that insect or uh from that infestation i wouldn't say that no insect is going to live there i just think that you're not going to be as likely to have an infestation but again you know so our well our knowledge only goes so far uh you know i think that fighting the war um in the way you said foliar so foliar application is about getting a very, very quick plant response by cutting out all of the extra work and at 80 ATP ex, uh, exp, uh, ex, exchange. You don't have to use as much energy. The plant doesn't have to push out exudates and suck back up nutrients. You put it right on the leaf surface. But the other side of that, or the other piece of that, that's just as important is the biology. Like if that plant has a really good biota on its, on its leaf tissue, then it true is going to be able to nutrient cycle that stuff extremely fast and push it into the plant system. So if you, if you have a, a super healthy plant, you're going to have a biota on it. If your plant's struggling or you're missing trace minerals or you don't have enough calcium, then that biota is probably not going to be nearly as strong as it would have been. Um, if, if you were perfect, uh, perfectly balanced. And this is where the addition of spraying, compost teas and extracts as a foliar helps to boast that biology by providing it with these easy easily absorbed or broken apart carbon chains uh, again just building the system building and building um, so you know I you know these conversations are wonderful and I hope the audience is like keeping up with with the importance of these conversations today was a really good one you guys I was uh I was a little nervous and apprehensive about how to best um, explain the system. And then when, when Peter told me uh, Brandon was hopping on, I was like, awesome. <laughs> Fucking target's not on me anymore. <laughs> so, the one thing, the one thing I've really appreciated from listening to John Kemp and, and his, his, some of his talks, and it's just, a, it's not one in particular, but it's a lot of them over it because he's pretty consistent, but but a lot of people will say, just increase your bricks. But what the fuck does that mean? You know what I'm saying? And that's the one question or, or how did I decrease my, how have I decreased my bricks or some of those questions. But like the way John breaks that down is, is pretty awesome because then you can realize, oh, okay, I got too much nitrogen. The plant's spending too much of its energy trying to process that. You know what I'm saying? So if I can balance that system out, somehow get rid of whatever and, and, 
bring that system more functioning, I can, that's how you increase bricks. You know what I'm saying? Like you're, he's, he's given you ideas and ways to look at it and how certain nutrients are going to play a role. He's often talking about manganese, you know, cause it's basically required to split that, that water molecule, which is the first step in photosynthesis. So like, you know what I mean? So he's always talking about that because if you don't have a proper amount of manganese, it's never going to be able to be super efficient at photosynthesis, you know? So again, it goes back to biogeochemical processes that are super fucking complex. And that's how you achieve bricks. That's how you achieve nutrient dense food. And nature does it just fine on her own. We're, we're the fucking problem. Because we're, we're trying to control the environment. We're trying to control the system. We're trying to force the plant to produce um, as much volume um, as possible without respect or regard for brick or nutrition or vitamin. So, you know, I think that the, 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 the focus should be on, I can't use the word plant health, can I? <laughs> What's a fucking healthy plant? You know, I, 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 I'm at a loss for words for, for how best, other than to say, without having a really healthy system, whether it's the plant, the soil, the environment, the air, everything around it. Um, this, this goes back to where I started with the triangle. I'm like, yeah, you sand, soap, and clay, but where's the organic matter? It really should be a diamond. And, and I think a lot of the ways we look at things as humans is, we we try to reduce it down to oh it's just these three things when in reality it's like no no it's way way more complex than that and maybe that side is not straight maybe that side undulates in and out so that there's even more variables that are are being pulled into play here so for lack of better words yeah i think that bricks is a good starting point in it for a conversation about plant health but i don't think that it's the end all be all i think that there's Again, a lot more behind it that, that we don't quite have a handle on yet. You said starting point. I almost, I kind of feel almost like bricks should be at the end. Like when you're being successful, you have successful flips, your environment's dialed in. Maybe then start to focus more on bricks because bricks got, can almost kind of seem deceiving if you're not also having healthy plants. Well, I mean, if, you're, if you're, uh, your bricks might be going up a little bit, but you're still uh, flipping deficient plants and that's your focus point, I, th I think you're going to always kind of have issues where getting back to kind of what you were saying, Layton, knowing that you're um, as diverse as possible, that should be able to improve. And, and then you should start to see that flip after flip. Once you start to see the overall health of the plant flip after flip, then start to really focus on bricks and maybe get yourself uh, uh, a digital one. Um, I feel like those are a, a lot easier to to work with. So I hope I didn't mis mislead you when I said let's go back to the beginning about the triangle, because I'm not saying when I I was saying I'm going back to the beginning of understanding that we don't know as much as we do, and so I was talking about the triangle of sand, silt, clay, and organic, which is missing organic matter. So I, I hope that I didn't you know confuse the audience with that when i said going back to the beginning i meant the beginning of today's show where we started by looking at that one graph that humanity had broken down into three pieces when in reality it should have been four does that make sense brian yeah, yeah. throwing up the rock right right yeah, so, got it. no i never meant for people to dive into bricks early on like you got so much other shit to focus on you got to focus on soil structure. What are you growing in? You're going to grow soil, soil S, or you're going to grow soil. And you know what are your what are your other components? Water, man. We didn't even get to water. That was another one that you know I've seen in the chat. They're talking about RO. Well, yeah, RO is stripped water. It's basically H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, and in that combination. It is pure acid, so it'll strip certain nutrients very, very quickly from whether it's in your body or in your soil. Um, it will bind to it, and then when the water molecule is broken apart into carbon and oxygen, 
or excuse me, hydrogen and oxygen, there's going to be another whole process. Now, the calcium that attached to that could now be bound up in what we call an organic form. And an organic form of calcium or nitrogen or phosphorus is almost impossible to break apart without heavy biological influences. And again, there's certain species of bacteria that break those down and there's others that can't break it down. That goes back to the diversity thing. So yeah, RO water is, is dangerous for a lot of reasons. Um, I, I put up a post on my IG about a way to remineralize RO water so that it's not going to steal it. Now, whether those nutrients that you have added to that RO water, RO water will become available, geobiological chemistry processes, I don't, I don't have the answer for that. All I know is that you've prevented that water from stealing things either from your body or from your soil or from your plant. Yeah. What do you think about RO water, Smiley? Well, I use RO water, so but um, my understanding do you drink of it? that my understanding of that is basically like water is is a solvent, like you said, and it has its ability this ability to hold a certain amount. So you can saturate water, right? Like with a certain amount of stuff sugar salt whatever right it can hold different things but but what you're talking about with ro is it's to me it is more like a uh like a blank net so to speak so in my in my uneducated thoughts on it would be that it, i just maybe made it so that it can hold a little more in solution than what it did before not necessarily like stealing from it so i don't know maybe i have a different concept of it but but that's my thoughts in my head on it is like it's it's a solution. It has ability to to hold stuff in solution. And, and if it's already got some mineral in there, then its capability has been lowered. You know what I'm saying? So it's not going to be able to hold as much other stuff in solution when you pour it into the soil or whatever. Does that make sense or not? Yeah. So think of it this way, right? Um, when you boil water, what happens? You've converted it to a gas, right? In its gaseous state, it holds very little, if any, nutrient because it's basically been uh, broken apart from all of its minerals. And that's why when you finish boiling the water down, you get that scale. Um, and if you took that scale and analyzed it, then yeah, you would see uh, a lot of calcium, a lot of potassium. So in the natural processes of the globe, Sun comes out, evaporates water. Water goes up as a very, very fine molecule. It gets to a certain point where it gets cold enough that it starts to attract to itself. Uh, and then it starts to form water droplets, and those droplets become rain. That rain comes back through the air. And nowadays we talk about acid rain. Why? Because that water absorbed the things in the air, the ash, the pollution, um, and has changed its pH. So now when it's raining, it's affecting the biology in the soil. Um, it's affecting the ability for that biology to uh, make available those, those minerals at certain levels. So it gets, yeah, it gets super fucking complex. But again, Smiley, what you said was spot on, man. I could take, if I could get real, real mineral water, I can add sugar to it. I could add honey to it. Um, I could add all kinds of things to that water. And that water would then take on those properties. So, you know, you're, you're, you're right about everything and probably nothing like our water technically would hold more nutrients because it's been stripped down, but would they become available? I, I, we don't have the ability to really answer that at this point until we, until we can really interact or have the ability to understand these tiny little processes that are happening at light speed or nano time. Um, on a on a molecular level, on a cellular level, on a, on on the just just like the the acids alone, the organic acids complicates everything. Um, cell death complicates these processes. So yeah, it gets fucking super deep, super quick, man. But yeah, RO water is acid. It has everything has been removed from it. It definitely will strip things. For sure, because it has to try to come back into um, stasis with itself. 
Um, and so whatever you're exposing it to, it's going to pull. Um, it's the same idea as like when you really get mineral water. Have you ever been where the water bubbles up in an artesian well and it's crystal clear and you taste it? You can taste the water. You can taste that crispness. That's, that is the opposite of RO water. That is mineralized water. So, you know, again, we still have so much fucking shit to, to learn. <laughs> what is, I know that they've, they've improved over the years, but it, what is the waste to ratio like for every gallon of RO that you produce? It's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, well, it continues to improve though. So do you know those numbers, Smiley? Is it like a two to one now or? Yeah, there's two to ones and three to ones I've seen out there. So, the the system I got was the uh, Hydrologic Evolve. Um, I forget, like one thousand or something was the number on it, but it uh, that one had two different valves that I could put in for the wastewater, and one was like a three to one, one was like a two to one. So I don't know why there was a like if that's just a different restriction or something. I don't know. To my understanding, it's basically that you're taking the water molecule and squeezing it through a rubber glove, right? Yeah. So you're, you're, you're literally forcing it to drop everything it can because you've put it under so much pressure. Well, you know, the other side of that is how much energy consumption is required to create the pressure to get a higher return, right? Yeah. So you might get two to one, you might get three to one, but what was the energy consumed to get that? Oh, exactly, because I got to run a lift pump to run it up to 80 PSI to be able to get it efficiently through the RO system. Right. You know, I mean, the yeah. RO filter itself. But, so, but so, Leighton, can I, can I challenge you or I guess offer a little different take? You were saying it's like an acid, but in my understanding, an acid like on a pH scale would be like percent of hydrogen, right? So like, it, you know, the more amount of hydrogen is going to be a lower pH. And then this is the inverse scale, basically. Yep. But but like, so if I'm pushing water through this membrane and it's coming out as straight H2O, and usually they're like a pretty neutral pH. So like, I don't see how it would have an effect similar to like an acid where it's going to be able to, an acid to my understanding is going to be able to exchange that hydrogen that it has to kind of break some of those bonds that are in there in the system a little bit, you know what I'm saying? And it's that exchangeable hydrogen that can actually cause some of those reactions to happen or not to happen you know and like oh, in row, it's just going to come out at seven so i'm not really going to be having that percentage of hydrogen there to cause that similar effect of like an acid you know so that's why i use the word like acid so it's it's not on a ph scale it, it it's more like think of it as a, a nitric acid that you dropped on something and it turned it into uh, something else. It melted it, it. It broke it apart. There's definitely something to the connection of hydrogen to both pH and to water molecules. But water is is known as the great solvent. And maybe that's the word that I should be using solvent, not acid, because it is confusing with pH. So but think about water. I mean, water eventually will break down anything. Right. It, it causes life, takes away life. Um, you can run it. You've all seen the Grand Canyon. <laughs> right. That, that's a solvent, man. It took that rock and cut, uh, you know, exposed, what, three billion, I think, years of, of, of um, soil building in that point. Like something crazy. Like you can go back. Maybe it's not maybe it's not billion. Maybe it's like 300 million years. You can see the layers of the rock uh, that were formed 380 million years ago. I think I think that's what it was. But so yeah, water is a solvent, and I shouldn't use the word acid, but it's the ultimate solvent on the planet. Yeah, because that's where like like my my brain was kind of wrapped around that that EH or the oxidation reduction too, and like relating that to pH. When I was listening, it's Olivier Husson had the six hour kind of presentation he did and, he, and then uh advancing eco agriculture had it available i don't know if it still is but but the way he was kind of describing that is like ph is is more 
in in the mindset of protons and measuring the amount of protons and then eh goes along the line of of kind of measuring the amount of electrons that are in that system and that's where kind of the the difference kind of comes into where like you know some some there's a relation to them because you have to have certain phs to get a certain eh is my understanding of that there's like a you know they kind of mirror each other but there's a variable to it a little but that's why is because it's, you're kind of measuring two different things with those one's measuring protons one's measuring electrons you know spot on and now now you're getting into particle theory and it gets really fucking crazy really quick you get into muons uh you get into higgins balsam pro, uh, particles i mean and and so again it's this like multi leveled um expose your to components that are in flux so like look at start looking into some part particle theory like uh the latest thing that we're looking for um i was just reading about it the other day is the particle associated to uh dark matter um and they've, they've been spending 10 years and I don't know how many, perhaps billions of dollars at CERN trying to chase down this particle. Um, and they figured they would they would get the higgins balson real quick, but they eventually did get that particle, but they still, the goal of, the, of that collider was to, to fucking identify, um, you know, dark energy or dark matter. And we didn't even get close. So the latest is, uh, They've created a new type of experiment, which is going to open up a whole nother fucking channel, dude, um, to these like understanding of, um, you know, electrons versus protons, where they came from, what they go back to after they've been in play or they have been broken apart um, by something else, some other influence that we don't even understand yet. But we do understand that they they do break apart and they do form. So you know, particle theory is fucking crazy. And so like, go ahead. To kind of tie that back into nutrient cycling, though. So like, um, way John Kempf kind of related that is like oxidation reduction is kind of like you can replace those words with nitrification and denitrification. You could switch it out for aerobic and anaerobic. You know what I mean? So like oxidation is aerobic, reduction is anaerobic. You know what I mean? Those are actually all kind of correlated. Mm -hmm. Nitrification happens anaerobically, denitrification happens aerobically, you know what I'm saying? So like relating that kind of gives you a better idea of how that relates in the whole nutrient cycling of that too. Because so like nitrogen in an oxidized form is that nitrate, that's that NH whatever, O minus three whatever it is or two uh, yep. uh, whatever you know what i mean but when you're reducing that if you look at the formula then it becomes a nh plus four or whatever so it's added you know what I mean? it's added electrons to that to be able to reduce that so that's where like some of those reactions those oxidation reducing reactions are moving that electron around in order to to actually be able to put that in a reduced form it needs to add that energy into it you know so from an oxidized state to a reduced state is something is adding energy into it and from a reduced state into an oxidized state it's giving up an energy source so that's why like ammonia is not as readily found in the soils as nitrate because the biology is a lot more going to react on that and actually release that energy leave it in a more oxidized state while it use that energy to itself you know and again it depends though in what environment right so you're you're spot on and i love the way you describe that because that was probably one of the simplest forms of uh an explanation that i've heard about again looking at shit from outside the box and understanding that yeah a lot of these things are correlated they're, 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 you're seeing the same things over and over in different areas like whether it's biological, whether it's chemically, whether it's geological, they're, they're, they're the similar paths that are happening or molecular, I should have said. Um, and that therefore, yeah, a lot of these terms should be able to cross over very simply. 
Um, but it gets complex when you start to say, okay, um, is it heavily biologically active or is it very minimally biologically active? And, and what are, what are, what are the consequences of that environment? In other words, you take the bottom of, or the side of a river where you step in it and you sink to your knee and you pull your foot out and it stinks like fucking hell. And that's highly compacted. It's, it's, you know, it's anaerobic. And so what are the limiting factors of that material is the fact that it doesn't have oxygen. Um, it doesn't have diverse biology. Now, when, when the spring floods come and then that mud gets churned up and turned into compost extract washes down the river it turns back into incredible fertility um so again it just gets fucking super complex as hell but i love the way you 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 presented that the denitrification nitrification redox uh potential is is you know something really important to look at but the biology controls all of it dude absolutely wow. that's where like olivier really nails it out of the park when he like instead of referring it to an ec on the eh when he's measuring that he started talking about it as a biological conductivity not electrical so like a biological conductivity kind of shifts your brain into thinking it's it's all happening in that ecosystem of the soil food web and the functioning of that is what's creating creating the conductivity that you're able to see happening through that soil you know fucking crazy shit right <laughs> it's deep man it's badass though you know what i mean but it's it's different than just trying to add in an electrolyte you know what i'm saying like a secondary metabolite from biology in my opinion and experience is kind of a lot a lot different than adding in an electrolyte of say nitrogen or whatever you know crazy man crazy shit Anyways, can we go get some lunch, man? I don't know about you guys, but I'm fucking hungry as hell. Yeah, I'm, I'm over here answering texts. Are you done yet? <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, you know, it's really fun when the, these kind of surprise things happen. And, you know, that's the fun part of this show is that it can be so flexible that it's just conversations. You know, there's no real like this is how it needs to be done. And I, I really like that approach because that way we continue to learn as a group. Agreed. Agreed. And the fact that uh, we got so many special guests pop on today, Smiley, thanks, brother. You know, Brandon, love you, brother. Um, it's awesome. And, you know, Brian, maybe this is more of the direction that we should head in in the future is that, you know, we, we, we don't debate we we bring people on and kick around all of these um, various uh, directions that we look at stuff because that's just that's just teaching on a whole nother level because you know again the the most fun that I've ever had at, at a conference was when you put a whole bunch of people up on a stage that have different approaches to something and then let them chop it up and just let let it see where the conversation goes I mean that, those are a blast so. But we'll we'll talk about that off camera. Uh, I want to ask. I saw it, they popped up. S. Bob was answering some questions, but uh, as far as it was debates go, sir, you were uh, number two on the list. Uh, so if you want to debate Layton, uh, I don't know how to get in touch with you, sir. I've put out some feelers, uh, and I, I guess they didn't get back to me on that. So um, if if the community still wants to see something like that. Um, I then, did course, I did send him an email and an Instagram DM. All right. So, good. And, you know, Bob, putting you on blast, he, he, sir. Whether you, you are, are or are not two. interested, just uh, get back to me and let me know either way. And again, you know, maybe the word debate's a little harsh. Maybe it should be debate conversation. Yeah, but uh, – I, I think we, Peter and myself, and maybe we were looking at more debate is like, there's going to be structure to it, you know? So it's not like one person can just dominate the conversation. And then there's uh, topics. Like we talk about a topic for 30 minutes and then maybe move on to something or an hour, you know, whatever it is, but there's a, uh, there's more structure to it than just, you know, uh, an actual just well, conversation, it, I guess, it, like on Thursday. It, it's also responding to points and not like hurling shit across the room at each other and like call, like calling someone a clown doesn't articulate your point or tell anybody why you what you disagree <laughs> that they say it's like okay like he's a clown like give me more like 
<laughs> so starting, you could say something nicer than the clown and just make your point of like, I disagree with point X and here's why based on my research and or experience. Well, you know what the thing about it is, is, uh, you know, a debate is a very structured conversation about a subject that has um, at least two sides, if not more. So what are we going to debate? Like, is someone going to come on and say that biology doesn't work and that only chemistry does? In which case I'm going to say, well, I disagree, but... Both. Nah, nah, that, that, that would definitely not be, no, nah, it, it, it's somewhat people within kind of the soil world. Um, and we can go either way. Like as, as these conversations are very loose, uh, we could have formal, but you, you would know the topic in advance. It'd be like, do you want to talk to so-and-so about this topic? Um, like the big one with you would be horizontal soil systems, right? Yep like someone who disagrees that they're a good idea um, and then they just articulate their points. So well, that's fair. I got no issues with that. I think that, I think that would be a, a good one to discuss. Oh, look at you on the road. <laughs> so, all right. So game changing. My old phone was an iPhone seven that had like a shattered screen and I'm in the basement all the time in the garage and I get no reception and it sucked. And I just got an iPhone 13. And so I'm sitting in the garage, like listening to the conversation being like, I'd like to be high right now, but like, I need to go outside to make that happen. Cause my wife hates me smoking in the house. So I was like, Holy shit. I could like bring my phone out there and just sit in the beach chair and listen to the conversation. And if they need me, I could be like, I can do that. <laughs> and I don't have to move. So then I was like, holy shit, I could go to the, I could get in my fucking car and drive to the post. Cause I used to like stream with the iPhone seven. It wasn't strong enough to handle StreamYard. So like if my phone would totally overheat, like my video would not work at all. And now I'm like, holy shit, I can do errands while I do this. <laughs> so You are so super you, clear. So, the so you guys could meet the lovely ladies at the Postal Service uh, headquarters uh, who do like the dank weed uh, and help me ship my packages all over the world. <laughs> so a bunch of, I, when any time they ever ask me what I'm saying to people, I'm always like, Christmas presents. <laughs> and they're like, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, they're tomato, uh, they're tomato I, seeds. I, I I keep them happy with good weed, uh, which they gladly accept. And uh, in return, they make sure all my packages get handled with tender love and care, at least within their facility. Nice, nice. So can you kill the stream from there on your phone or no? I sure can. I can wow. do anything I want. Look at you. Layton's like, so can we get back to going to lunch? <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, so and he wants I, to go play. He's been being yeah. good all day. I think too, uh, Layton. When if these debates ever really did happen, I think more people would also see how hard it is to just sit here off the cuff and talk about things, man. So just big ups to you every week, just talking about so many different subjects and and, and trying your best to explain it to everybody. Layton was born for this. Yeah, I was. I was cursed at this, right? <laughs> no, it's great, man. Definitely appreciate that. I'd second that. All right, we are now at the post office. All right. You want All right, I got to drop off. I'm right. blowing up over here. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye. And